So we are going to continue. We're going to jump right into content, and this actually addresses some of the questions we've been seeing in the in the Zoom. So I'm glad that it is our next session. We are going to turn from measurement to exploring the animal model application to human application. And our first uh, speaker for this afternoon is joining us virtually. So I will turn to Dr. Patricia Dixon who is Professor of Pediatrics and Chief of Genetics and Genomic Medicine at Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. She also was just elected to the Association of American Physicians, so we send our congratulations for that. Um, and Dr. Dixon, that's your introduction. If we could have you come up on screen, we will turn to you for your slides, and I'm pausing just another 30 seconds to make sure that she's there. I am here. Perfect. We can hear you, Dr. Dixon. Okay, perfect. And okay, can you see my slides now? We can. Okay, great. Um, so uh, I apologize in advance that this talk is extremely wonky. So I'm just going to dive right in to, to the science here. Um, okay, so um, we're looking at membrane tethered NAGLU to explore origins of CSF heparin sulfate. So um, we had been doing a lot of preclinical research in evaluating intrathecal enzyme replacement therapy. As part of that research, which was um, being performed in the um, MPS1 or Hurler dogs, we evaluated heparin sulfate glycosaminoglycans in cerebrospinal fluid. So shown on this graph are uh, pre-treatment um, heparin sulfate uh, glycosaminoglycans um, performed by a non-reducing acid end method. So the methods are here on the right um, for those who want to get into the methodology. Um, so uh, pre-treatment and then uh, post uh, each monthly intrathecal dose of enzyme replacement therapy. So this is right before the second dose, right before the third dose of monthly um, enzyme replacement therapy um, administered into the cisterna magna of the dogs. And we showed um, reduction in the cerebrospinal fluid um, heparin sulfate. We had also evaluated brain um, heparin sulfate um, by this method. And this is just a graph showing a uh, correlation, uh, linear regression of uh, the glycosaminoglycans in the cerebrospinal fluid to the glycosaminoglycans. And again, this is heparin sulfate, um, non-reducing end method, um, glycosaminoglycans in the cerebral cortex showing that there seemed to be um, a relationship. We also, however, noted that um, intravenously delivered enzyme replacement therapy appeared to have a therapeutic effect when administered very early um, in, in animals. And this is uh, in MPS1 dogs uh, that was done, work done by Matthew Ellen Wood and his group. Uh, where uh, dogs that were dosed from birth with intravenous enzyme replacement therapy showed a reduction in brain glycosaminoglycans. And this is an older paper where we looked at the dye, we used the dye binding method. Um, so you can see here the normal animals, the untreated MPS1 dogs, um, dogs that received intrathecal intravenous, and then two dose groups of intravenous enzyme replacement therapy showing uh, that their brain glycosaminoglycans were lower than in the untreated. Uh, dogs, despite having very little uh, levels of idronidase, but there was um, some idronidase activity, so enzyme activity in the brain, so about two to four percent of normal. Uh, and we also, by um, Taludine Blue, uh, showed that there was um, less storage in the in the treated dogs in um, in the brain. Uh, we also observed that in MPS1 patients who had received intravenous enzyme replacement therapy that we saw a reduction in CSF heparin sulfate. Um, and these were the MPS1 patients who had been participants in the initial um, alderzyme study um, that had been published in the New England Journal. Some of them had um, had cerebrospinal fluid acid um, during, the, during the study. And uh, we found that all of them show lower levels of CSF heparin sulfate uh, after uh, 26 or 52 weeks of weekly intravenous enzyme replacement therapy. Um, we also uh, ran a correlation of, uh, by again, by linear regression of CSF heparin sulfate and serum heparin sulfate. Um, and there was a, um, a relationship uh, between those, those two um, values. And so um, we wondered about a couple of different potential hypotheses. Um, 
the most likely hypothesis that we you know thought was that the intravenous enzyme replacement therapy was crossing into the blood brain crossing the blood brain barrier entering the brain in some um, small amount but enough to potentially lower heparin sulfate in the brain and that was why uh, maybe why CSF heparin sulfate was was going down um, the other thought was you know could there be some interesting science where CSF heparin sulfate might be um, might not reflect brain and maybe that CSF sulfate that we're seeing has in some ref is reflecting what ha is happening in in the bloodstream. Um, and so we um, designed an experiment to potentially test this hypothesis. Um, for this, we turned to a uh, methodology that Mark Sands lab had developed in um, evaluating membrane tethered enzymes as a way to restrict cross correction um, when doing uh, different experiments. So here he took galactoserubrosidase, uh, the enzyme that is deficient in um, the lysosomal disease, Crab A disease, or globoid, ser uh, lipo globoid cell leukodystrophy. And um, he uh, transfected cells with lentiviral um, galsy or the lentiviral galsy, which is tethered to the lysosomal membrane using the transmembrane domain of um, lysosomal associated membrane protein one or LAMP1. So he first showed that doing this doesn't reduce or destroy the activity of the Galsy. When you express this construct in the cells, the intracellular activity is, is excellent. Um, but then he looked at the media, the secreted media, and showed that, <clears throat> excuse me, the cells that are transfected with the membrane tether Galsy did not secrete that Galsy into the media. Um, so uh, the tether it was working to keep that, that enzyme into the cells. Um, it was uh, enzymatically active against substrate, as shown by cycazine uh, levels being reduced in both the gal and the gal lamp treated cells. So at this point, we were working in the MPS uh, San Filippo B syndrome, or MPS3B, and the enzyme deficient in that is NAGLU. So we generated a membrane tethered NAGLU using Mark Sands construct approach um, with the um, transmembrane domain of LAMP1. We transfected cells with the lentiviral lamp, NAGLU lamp one, and showed again that the same thing you see intracellular enzyme activity, but no secretion into media. We also looked at beta hexosaminidase, which is a marker of um, lysosomal storage. It's elevated in the cells just to show that we think it's enzymatically active um, against substrate in the cells. So then we looked at a way to deliver this uh, to the MPS3B mice in a way that would treat the body and not the brain. So um, the AAV7 has been shown by others uh, to treat, when you give it intravenously, to treat the body, but does not reach the brain, does not cross the blood-brain barrier, as you can see by this PET scan in mice, and also by this graph looking at the vector copy numbers um, in the brain uh, with the different uh, viruses administered intravenously. So we dosed San Filippo B mice with uh, the I intravenous AAV7 NAGLU LAMP1 construct and um, with a ubiquitous promoter, and then compared to untreated affected and carrier mice. We injected them by tail vein at four weeks of age and studied them at eight weeks of age. And so you can see from the graph on the left uh, that there is no NAGLU activity in the brain. There is good NAGLU activity in the systemic organs, so liver, heart, uh, and no NAGLU activity in the serum, which we expect because the NAGLU doesn't get secreted when it's tethered to the lysosomal membrane. Um, we did the beta hexosaminidase activity, um, again, showing there's no, looks like no treatment effect in the brain, but treatment effect um, in the other organs. And then we sent serum, CSF, and brain samples to the UCSD glycoanalytics core to measure total heparin sulfate by mass spec. Uh, and on the left, you can see the serum levels of heparin sulfate in the carrier mice, the um, untreated affected mice, and the mice treated with the AV7 NAGLU lamp, um, showing that we this uh, treatment to the body reduced the serum heparin sulfate. However, the CSF heparin sulfate was not decreased in those mice despite the serum heparin sulfate going down. And as you can see also, the brain heparin sulfate was not reduced with the AAV7 NAGLU lamp treatment. Next, we wanted to see if it was possible to treat 
the brain and not the body. Um, this was a little bit more challenging because as um, Dr. Munzer explained, anything you put into the CSF is going to, or the brain is going to get out into the systemic circulation because it's normal CSF turnover. So um, for this, we use the AAV9 viral vector, which we know um, will um, transduce brain very nicely. Um, but we used a synapsin-1 promoter so that it would only express um, the transgene in neurons. We delivered it intracerebroventricularly to try to minimize exposure to the, uh, to the bloodstream and systemic circulation. Um, and we treated um, the neonatal mice to try so that we could try to maximize the distribution throughout the brain from that single injection point. So we treated the mice at postnatal day one or two, studied them at four weeks of age. Um, shown here is the NAGLU enzyme activity, showing that we were able to successfully confine the NAGLU um, activity to the brain. We did not see any NAGLU activity in the liver, heart, kidney, and importantly, in the serum. Uh, we did immunofluorescence uh, to confirm that we had good distribution through the brain and that we were expressing the NAGLU in neurons. Um, so shown here on the left is a coronal hemisection of mouse uh, brain neocortex, um, showing the green as the um, NAGLU, uh, showing very good widespread distribution um, of this through um, throughout the brain regions. And on the right here, this is a co-localization of NAGLU with nu N for neuronal nuclei. Um, we did not see co-localization with um, microglia or astrocytes um, in these samples. Again, we sent brain, CSF, and serum to the UCSD glycoanalytics core for measurement of heparin sulfate uh, by mass spec. Um, and in brain, as expected, we saw a reduction um, to carrier levels of um, heparin sulfate in the mice that were treated with the AAV9 um, syn synapsin 1, NAGLU lamp 1. Um, in CSF, we also saw a dramatic reduction in um, heparin sulfate in the treated mice and there was no reduction in heparin sulfate in serum um, of these mice um, that were not treated, that where the NAGLU did not reach the, the blood the body. So in summary, with intravenous AAV NAGLU lamp one, this was delivered systemically with a vector that does not cross the blood brain barrier. We saw NAGLU activity in heart, liver, kidney, and not serum or brain and heparin uh, sulfate was observed to be reduced in serum, but not in CSF or brain. With the intracerebroventricular AAV9 synapsin 1, NAGLU lamp 1, this was delivered to the brain and expressed in neurons. We saw NAGLU activity in the brain, but not the liver, heart, kidney, or serum. Heparin sulfate of these mice was reduced in brain and CSF, but not serum. And thanks to the many people who did um, this experiment in our labs. Thank you. Uh, I'll just note that you continue our um, perform on time performance of our speakers. No pressure, Dr. Ellenwood. Um, and we will turn, Dr. Dixon, we will see you again for the panel discussion after the next five speakers. So, Dr. Ellenwood, you are next up and um, you are joining us as the Chief Scientific Officer with the National MPS Society. I'm going to step out of the way so that you can jump into your slides. Great, thank you. I'm very pleased to be here. I'd like to thank the Reagan Udall Foundation for the opportunity to speak to you. I am a comparative medical geneticist. I've been working in the field for a quarter of a century, even though I'm now at the National NPS Society. That was after nearly a 20-year academic career working primarily on large animal models of these disorders. These are my disclosures. So there's a tremendous need for uh, preclinical models for MPS 3B and other San Filippo syndromes. That's been elucidated by our guests. I won't spend too much time on it. Uh, I did have an interesting conversation with a colleague who said, SMA was able to get to an approval. How come San Filippo can't? It is 10 times less frequent. It has a slowly or moderately progressive disease with a difficult readout compared to neuromuscular events. 
all of these impact the ability for us to get to an easy approval. In this context, large animal models become important. We don't do dog studies lightly, and I think there is a strong ethical need to do so, and that prompted us to work in these disorders. Dr. Uh, Munzer, my colleague, talked to you about the diversity of neuropathic MPSs. Uh, there are seven large animal models of neuropathic MPSs in uh, multiple species, or seven species. Uh, these are seven different loci, seven different species, two classes of enzymes, seven different kinds of non-reducing ends. All of them store heparin sulfate intralysosomally in the brain. They are all fatal neuropathological conditions. This has been proven as a biomarker of fatal neurodegenerative disease with the support of 640 million years of uh, of, of evolutionary time that separates us from avians. Canine models of MPS3 uh, uh, are all similar. Even though it's adult onset, it's a severe canine disease. Uh, they all uh, suffer and have a fatal uh, cerebellar ataxia, and the MPS3B model has been characterized both at the molecular and pathological level. Uh, the clinical signs we see in the dogs, which begin at 24 months of age, are a wide-stepping gait, hypermetria, truncal swaying, movie can start any time, uh, 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 postural instability. They literally cannot stand, shake their head at the same time. They also have an interesting reflex. When you hold their heads vertically, they can't write it normally. They continue to fall to the ground uh, at the end stages of disease. And we've used that reflex quantitatively to help prove therapy. You'll see cerebellar rebound right here. When we look at end stage, we see pronounced uh, storage in neurons, a pronounced microgliosis and astrocytosis. And importantly, you will see that little structure at the base of the brain, uh, the cerebellum is remarkably atrophied. And those folds of the cerebellum, uh, they become so atrophied that cerebrospinal fluid can be imaged within them. I'll talk about a study that is in support of a program at Alevix. Uh, the compound is called AX250. It began as BN250. It is now tralacinidase alpha. Uh, this is a uh, prevention treatment model. Dogs started with intraventricular or intracisternal infusions at approximately five months of age. They went out for 42 uh, infusions every two weeks, up to about 24 months of age. And the results were astounding. This shows you the uh, uh, brain tissue gags as a result of the treatment dose. It was either vehicle, 12 milligrams or 48 milligrams of the compound. We see normalization using the disaccharide heparin sulfate method as well as the non-reducing end method at 48 milligrams. When we look at the CSF, we see the same result incredibly striking normalization using the NRE method specific for MPS3B. And not surprisingly, as Maria had shown, because this assay is validated, we get virtually perfect correlations uh, of these with our values uh, up, approaching uh, 9.09 uh, uh, or 0.9. We see over time a decrease in uh, CSF uh, heparin sulfate and non-reducing ends throughout the study uh, with near normalization at 48 milligrams within the first couple of administrations. We see improvements in uh, staining for lysosomal volume using LAMP1, which is a marker for lysosomal membranes, in three regions in the brain, in the hippocampus, cortex, and cerebellum, with significant normalization uh, in the cortex and cerebellum. We see decreased neuroinflammation as a, uh, uh, noted in microglial activation uh, in the cerebellum, and we also see a decrease in pathological uh, astrocytosis. Importantly, though, we need to be able to prevent the atrophy we see in this model. In the central panel is a T2-weighted image, and you can see the brighter images within those folds of the cerebellum, that's CSF. We can quantitate that and use it as an inverse proxy of, of atrophy. And when we do that throughout the study, starting at about 12 months up to the end of the study, we see the affected animals have higher, untreated animals have a high level 
of CSF in the cerebellum indicating atrophy. And at the, lowest, uh, at the highest dose of 48 milligrams, we see uh, virtually no atrophy compared to the normal animals. And we can see this at the end of the study, a significant decrease between the untreated affected and the animals at 48 milligrams. And we also see a very striking correlation between the cerebellar volumes and the uh, NREs in the cerebrospinal fluid. It's important, though, to quantify this atrophy. And so we did a kinematic study of volu evaluating that he uh, head uh, bob uh, effect. And we saw a difference in ma maximum angular velocity. The affected animals' heads drop more slowly because they have less control. And you see the vehicle-treated affected animals, very uh, uh, big difference. Whereas in the animals dosed at 12 and 48 milligrams, they were equivalent to the normal untreated animals. We also wanted to evaluate behavior. We did this in something called a uh, uh, t-test reversal, uh, where animals are taught a task and then asked to reverse that task. And it's based on baited uh, rooms that they can go into on different sides of a t-arm. All uh, arms are baited. They just only have access to one, because dogs are very clever and they can smell. So we need to make sure we take care of that. <laughs> From sessions one to five, the normal animals learn the task. Uh, and that they did so in a statistical way. The affected animals that were treated with vehicle, they could not learn the task. And the animals that were treated with 12 and 48 milligrams of uh, drug uh, performed equivalently to the normal uh, unaffected animals. So this is what we've been able to do in the largest and longest large animal study uh, for a neuropathic MPS disorder. But this story is not isolated just to canine MPS3B. This has been replicated in other situations, including the MPS2 mouse, the MPS3A mouse, involving four different enzymatic therapies. This is not uh, uh, under dispute. Brain-targeted enzyme will decrease uh, brain heparin sulfate, and we are able to measure that quantitatively in the cerebral spinal fluid. All of these images correlate brain tissue and cerebrospinal fluid heparin sulfate. And you can see near perfect um, uh, correlation of these. So in conclusion, comparative biology and 640 years of evolutionary biology confirm that heparin sulfate is the proximal and inciting cause of neuropathology in these seven disorders. That is not in dispute. And I think we've shown, using multiple modalities in a large animal model, that we can see improved tissue pathology, decreased neuroinflammation, per, uh, prevention of CNS atrophy, and improved behavior. And with that, I end under time. Mark your calendars. I've never done this before. <laughs> Thank you. Dr. Ellen would thank you so much. We will see you later for the question and answer session. So for our final uh, rapid fire presentation, when we want to speak to um, animal models and what we are learning here, we're gonna turn to Dr. N Nadal Bulos. Sorry, Dr. Bulos, I was <laughs> practicing and failed there. But Dr. Bulos is the Director of Clinical Outcomes Research at Regenex Bio with a primary responsibility of managing outcomes that support translational medicine and biomarkers. Take it away. Thank you. I'd like to start by thanking the Reagan Udall Foundation for this workshop and for the opportunity for me to be here today to present to you. OK, there we go. So uh, what I'd like to do today is take you through the journey of bringing RGX one to one gene therapy as a candidate for the treatment of neuropathic MPS2. So RGX one to one is an AAV9 vector-based product that is designed to deliver a functioning copy of the IDS gene into the CNS with the potential to restore I2S enzyme activity. An I2S enzyme is the enzyme that is missing in MPS2 patients. RGX one to one is currently being investigated in a clinical trial. We just completed enrollment in our pivotal study, and it is a one-time injection into the CNS that is designed to address the unmet need of CNS disease involvement in neuropathic MPS2 patients. 
So the safety and the scientific rationale for RGX one to one were studied comprehensively in a biologically relevant mouse model of MPS2. RGX one to one was administered into the CSF via intracerebral ventricular injection into the mice. And what you're seeing here are three cohorts of mice. You have wild type mice, untreated MPS2 mice, and MPS2 mice that have been treated with RGX one to one. So when we looked at CNS I2S activity, we see that we are able to detect CNS uh, I2S activity in the MPS2 mice that have been treated with RGX one to one compared to um, the, the uh, wild type mice. The so then we then looked at gag storage in these um, uh, tissues. We looked at 12 regions of the brain and the spinal cord. And as you can see, the untreated MPS2 mice store high levels of CNS gag um, in all of the tissues. And we see a significant reduction in these gag storage in the MPS2 treated mice. And those levels are not significantly different than levels in wild type mice. So we then looked at neurobehavioral assessment in these mice using the Barnes Maze tool. The Barnes Maze tool is a measure of spatial learning and memory in these mice. What you're seeing here is the average time that it takes the mice to escape a circular platform. It's measured over consecutive, uh, six consecutive days. And the, the concept is that the mice will get better at escaping the platform the more uh, with every day as they become familiar with that platform. And you can see that at treated uh, MPS2 treated mice um, get better with every day at escaping the platform. Similarly, we see that with the wild type mice. However, if you look at the untreated MPS2 mice, you see that they do not get better, better between days three and six. Although RGX one to one is administered into the CNS, we see that it does cross the blood brain barrier and shows a systemic effect. So what we're seeing here is tissue gags um, from various tissues and organs within these mice. You can see high levels of gags that are stored in untreated MPS2 mice. These are significantly reduced in mice that have been treated with RGX one to one, and those levels are very similar to levels that are seen in wild type mice. Untreated MPS2 mice also excrete large volumes of uh, gag in the urine. Again, we see normalization of uh, urine excretion um, in treated MPS2 mice, and these levels are very similar to levels that are seen in wild type mice. So we've heard earlier from Dr. Munzer that neuropathic forms of MPS2, they exhibit elevated levels of heparin sulfate. And this table here summarizes the various types of MPS. And you can see that those that manifest with neurologic symptoms do show heparin sulfate as the main gag that is stored. So heparin sulfate is a key biomarker in neuropathic MPS types. So heparin sulfate is a long polysaccharide chain. In MPS2 disease, the absence of the I2S enzymes leads to accumulation of the sulfated ends. And we've heard from Dr. Fuller earlier about the various methods to measure heparin sulfate. So these two sulfated ends accumulate on the non-reducing terminals of the heparin sulfate chain. In our study, we used the enzymatic digestion method to break down this heparin sulfate further into its basic subunits, which are the disaccharide subunits. We developed a, and, and um, validated a bioanalytical method that measures these specific disaccharides. And you can see here the various disaccharides that can form. I do want to point to D2S6 because it has that 2-sulfate that is specific for activity of the I2S enzyme. This is a preclinical model that was published by another group um, and where they tested a number of various uh, treatment modalities in MPS2 mice. Again, you can see that in MPS2 mice, there's high levels of brain uh, heparin sulfate in the brain that accumulates. These levels normalize with their vector therapy that is targeted to enter the brain. In this study, they also measured various disaccharides of, of heparin sulfate. And I do want to point out again in red there, D2S6. So what they have shown when looking at the percent contribution of each of those disaccharides to total heparin sulfate, you see that there are about 31% of total heparin sulfate in the brain comes from heparin sulfate D2S6. Heparin sulfate D2S6 was also the disaccharide that was most responsive to treatment. And then these reductions in heparin sulfate D2S6 associated with corrections in disease parameters that include neuroinflammation and astrocytosis. And we also saw normalization in neurocognitive behavior in these mice. 
So what I'd like to do for the next part of this presentation is really walk you through how we took these preclinical findings and translated them to a human application. So during our RGX one-to-one -one clinical development program, we were able to access a human CSF from neuropathic MPS2 patients, from attenuated MPS2 patients, and we were also able to access um, CSF from healthy individuals. We used our bioanalytically validated method to measure specific disaccharides within the heparin sulfate chain. And the graph there shows you the specific, uh, the four disaccharides that we measure and the contribution of each of those disaccharides to total heparin sulfate within the CSF. And you can see again there, um, highlighted in red, that when we look at the percent contribution of each of those disaccharides to total heparin sulfate, we see that about 30% of total heparin sulfate is made in the neuronopathic MPS2 patients comes from heparin sulfate D2S6. And that's higher than what we see in attenuated and in normal. You also see that heparin sulfate D2S6 was elevated in neuronopathic MPS2 compared to normal and attenuated MPS2. So when we look at the concentration levels of total heparin sulfate in the CSF samples, we, as expected, see that there are increasingly high levels of heparin sulfate, total heparin sulfate in urinopathic samples when compared to attenuated and when compared to normal. However, when we specifically look at heparin sulfate D2S6, not only do we see that those levels are really high in neuronopathic CSF samples, we also see that those levels distinguish between phenotypes, between attenuated and between neuronopathic phenotypes. So heparin sulfate D2S6 is reflective of disease pathology and can distinguish between disease phenotypes. So in, as part of our RGX one-to-one -one clinical trial, we are using heparin sulfate as a, uh, D2S6 as a surrogate endpoint that is reasonably likely to predict clinical benefit in urinopathic MPS2. And the reason for that is we're tracking it more closely because it makes sense for our trial, it makes sense for MPS2. We've, we, show, we know that it has the 2-sulfate on the non-reducing end that is very specific for the I2S enzyme. We've shown that it correlates with total heparin sulfate, and preclinical mouse models have shown that it correlates with other disease parameters. And the graph on the right shows data from our pivotal trial. So we see very early responses in heparin sulfate D2S6 as early as week 16 post-treatment in urinopathic MPS2 patients. Majority of these patients at week 16 have levels of heparin sulfate D2S6 that are below the, level, the maximum level that is seen in attenuated patients. And we have a number of patients that have shown normalized levels within heparin sulfate D2S6. So to summarize, heparin sulfate is a surrogate endpoint that is reasonably likely to predict uh, clinical benefits. HS accumulation results from a missing enzyme, so it is a mechanistic uh, tie there. Uh, heparin sulfate is the metabolite that causes disease pathology in neuronopathic MPS. And heparin sulfate D2S6 disaccharide is in the CSF is reflective of disease pathology and shows distinct concentration levels that differentiate between neuronopathic and non-neuronopathic MPS2. So disease models that reflect aspects of clinical pathology, gene therapy that expresses a missing enzyme have been successful in restoring enzyme activity in relevant tissues. This restoration of enzyme activity has associated with normalization of the pathologic substrate, which in this case is heparin sulfate GAG. And we also see improved neurocognitive performance in mice as assessed by behavioral therapy. So in translating RGX one-to-one -to, -one to the treatment of children with neuropathic MPS2, we have validated and um, developed an accurate and a validated method to measure CSF heparin sulfate D2S6. We have shown significant reductions in heparin sulfate D2S6 in the CSF with levels approaching normal in the pivotal study. Therefore, accurate and sensitive measurements of CSF heparin sulfate, including heparin sulfate D2S6, do have the potential to be considered as surrogate endpoints that are reasonably likely to predict clinical benefits. And I'll stop here and thank you for listening.
but let's move now to, we, we it just recapping, right? We learned about MPS. We learned about measuring heparin sulfate. We just talked through the animal model component. And now we want to focus on the relationship between cerebrospinal heparin sulfate levels and clinical outcomes. I'll note there are a number of questions about this in the chat that I'm confident are going to be answered with these presentations. So for our first speaker, we will welcome uh, Simon Jones, who serves as a consultant in Pediatric Inherited Metabolic Diseases at the Willick Unit at G in Genoic Medicine at St. Mary's Hospital in Manchester in the UK. In addition to being a consultant, Dr. Simon is a professor and a medical director at the National Institute for Health Research. And Dr. Jones, I will call you Dr. Jones instead of Dr. Simon, at least this time. So Dr. <laughs> Jones, take it away. Thank you very much. Uh, it is great to be here. Thank you for inviting a non-US person as well as Dr. Fuller, of course. Um, so yeah, it's great to be here, and I'm going to try and talk about the experience that we've had in Manchester, uh, where we've been looking after patients with MPS 2 and 3 um, for uh, many decades now, and I've been personally involved in both clinical care and research of these patients for the last 18 years. Um, and we've had a real interest in trying to solve some of the problems of San Filippo, um, and I'll talk about our successes and failures, perhaps more failures than successes. So I'll try and be honest here. We have one of the largest clinics for MPS children in, in Europe, um, and, um, and we do a lot of early phase trials. Um, so I, I have put a question mark at the end of that title, but hopefully we'll answer it, and this is being answered as the day goes on. So I'm going to start uh, with a graph that you've seen before. This is the famous Elsa Shapiro's MPS3A natural history study, looking at development, um, and this is the Vineland and adaptive behavior scale, looking at the development of children with MPS3A. So of course, all of these children entered a natural history study, did not get treatment. So when we talk about sacrifice, we hear about these parents subjected or allowed their children to have lumbar punctures multiple times over a two year period. Um, as well as all of the very detailed assessments. The first thing when we think about and um, we look at this graph, this is um, uh, you see children developing initially in the normal range, then plateauing and then decreasing, so losing skills. And we've heard this repeatedly in descriptions of this disease. The first thing we, th we, we see from a clinical trial perspective is what you want in your trial population is homogeneity. They've all got to be the same. And so those lines in blue are all of the slowly progressing children. So they start at a higher level, so they gain more skills, and then they decline much more slowly. So they should be much better treatment candidates, OK? Much greater window for intervention. But what you see from this graph is they're very heterogeneous. They each follow their own path. So I'm sorry, from a clinical trial perspective, they're out already. So we've got a rare disease population that's already shrunk because they're not homogeneous enough. So, and our best patients have already been excluded. So we look at this classical or rapidly progressive phenotype here. And we see that whilst it's more homogeneous, actually there's a fair bit of variation, especially at some certain ages that sort of, uh, and we heard earlier about the typical diagnostic age of these children being between about three and five years of age. Where actually, if you look here, this is months along the bottom. Uh, that's where the significant heterogeneity is, even in this classic or rapidly progressive phenotype. So we're thinking about our perfect MPS3A trial. And, and being in a unit that has been trying to develop a therapy for this disease for, as I said, maybe nearly 20 years now, we did sit down and think, what was the perfect MPS3A trial? You know, what would we do? Well, it made some sense to start treatment early, so under the age of two, because that, you know, they're still in the normal developmental curve. So if we want to get a really ideal top result, you'd treat them really, really early while their development's normal. And then what you've just got to show is that you keep it normal. So that, that makes sense from lots of perspectives. Um, uh, and, and we also thought about, well, what about later treatment? So the advantage of later treatment than earlier treatment is that, well, the later treatment is where the patients are. This is where they are when they're being diagnosed. So if you want the prevalent patients, you want to be able to open your trial and recruit it all at once, then you'd take this group. And this group 
are actually as likely to respond and benefit as this group. The problem is determining what a response is and measuring that response. If we treat kids in normal neurodevelopment and follow them for many, many years, and they're still in normal neurodevelopment, then you've probably got a good treatment outcome. If you take children in this messy, difficult, symptomatic age, they may well show dramatic benefit, because remember, they're not declining yet. If you could stop them declining, then you could achieve dramatic benefit. But how you measure that benefit is profoundly difficult. If you, because what we're talking about is modification of a vector. And there are multiple competing vectors, the progression of the disease, the advancement of normal development, and the treatment effect. So what that looks like, what a good result, what success is in that age group is actually really difficult to pin down, and no one's been able to quite define it in advance, which, as you will all know from clinical trials, is somewhat difficult. If you don't know what you're aiming for, how do you measure it? And our testing of neurocognitive outcomes is very good, very accurate. But the main manifestation of the patient in this group is behavior. That's what our patients, that's what my patients tell me in clinic. How the hell do we manage the behavioral aspects? And we've almost no good way that I can see of measuring that aspect. And so we're stuck with this important yet difficult in terms of a clinical trial outcome. So the real challenge of going early, well, one of the real challenges is that actually it's really hard to find patients. So um, yes, we've done a trial like this. But we estimated, looking back on our lab's diagnosis of MPS3A under the age of two, we looked back on 15 years of that diagnosis, and only 10% of patients were picked up in that age group, sometimes because of an older sibling, sometimes just dumb luck, really. Um, I'm a clinician, I can say that. Yeah, we rely sometimes on dumb luck. Um, so it's really difficult to find patients. But the other challenge here is that if we treat at the age of one or 18 months, how long does it take before these patients clearly diverge from the natural history of the disease? Well, you're talking that they need to be five or six years to be clearly different from those natural history populations. And that's pretty challenging. I have to say, having run trials um, that are not like this and run trials that are like this um, on an academic grant or even with commercial funding, um, it's very, very difficult to do this, uh, and almost impossible. So we've got a real challenge here with clinical trials. I want to talk about a tale of three trials um, that I was a PI in. Um, first of all, a commercial trial. We, we've heard these mentioned before uh, with intrathecal enzyme replacement therapy, um, no longer continued. A trial we did as an academic unit of a nutraceutical um, that was being used by the majority of MPS3 families worldwide, and then an ongoing academic stroke commercial trial uh, of gene therapy at the moment. So this, um, and I think Joe mentioned um, this trial earlier on. Um, uh, there were similar trials from Shire looking at intrathecal enzyme administration in both MPS2 and MPS3A, mostly starting at around the same kind of time. Um, this is from one of our posters at the time showing uh, a really dramatic reduction in CSF heparin sulfate. And as Joe mentioned, the, uh, this was nearly 15 years ago when this trial started. And so the early CSF markers, or the early CSF GAG marker, or heparin sulfate as we say it is, was based on a relatively poor methodology, and so suggested that we had almost complete clearance of those CSF GAGs. And so this made it really difficult to choose the correct dose. So we treated patients in Manchester for six years on this study every month, um, looking back at the reanalysis of those CSF samples with the more modern techniques that Maria Fuller described to us. Actually, the CSF reduction in heparin sulfate reduction in MPS3A was 40 to 60%, in MPS2 less than that. And the doses that we're using, 45 to 90 milligrams once a month, uh, and even less than that in MPS2, when we compare those with the approved enzyme replacement therapy for CLN2, where we give 300 milligrams of enzyme every other week to the ventricles, 
Um, well, we were probably one or two logs out, actually, in the dosing. And that's not a criticism of the work at the time. This was pioneering work that had never been tried before. Um, but and this led to a discontinuation of this program, um, despite the fact that almost certainly patients had benefited. I still followed them up, you know, these patients, um, eight or nine years after the study stopped. So difficult. This is an example of a relatively poor, old-fashioned CSF heparin sulfate assay that led to wrong dosing decisions that led to a study failing. Another study, this one an academic study, this compound genistein. Um, it's a soya derivative, um, and um, uh, there was some nice work in patient fibroblasts and in our animal model of MPS3A uh, and B, showing that this reduced heparin sulfate. Um, and so um, because of this, and because this was available over the internet, um, about half the patients in the world were taking it. Some of them are spending really quite large amounts of money. And so we tried to run an academic trial to answer the question of whether this actually worked or not, and whether this was meaningful. Um, and we got all of our funding from the patient organizations, the UK and the national MPS um, uh, societies. Um, and because we ran this study in the UK, we spoke, am I allowed to say this? We spoke to the MHRA, who are the UK regulator. Um, and, and we came to them and said, look, this is really difficult. We've only got so much funding. We, we've got a window of opportunity to do this study. And so um, there were already some other trials recruiting the very young patients. And so what we were left with with recruited onto the study was the prevalent patients, most of whom were already near the floor of most of those neurocognitive tests. So we knew, and because we could only afford to run this study for one or two years, we knew that we couldn't use in those patients a neurocognitive outcome measure. We had to use something else. And so we went to the imagery and said, look, the CSF heparin sulfate is the only thing we can use that will actually give us a readout. Would you accept us using this as a primary endpoint in a phase three trial? And they said yes. And we were surprised that they said yes, but they said yes. Uh, on the grounds that actually, it, if they stopped, this was the only way to run a study. If we didn't run the study, we hadn't kept people safe because people were already taking this drug. So simply preventing us from doing the trial didn't keep patients any safer. So it was actually safer to run the trial. And so we did. And we recruited 20 patients with MPS3. And what we could see was, um, with this drug, we only re reduced the CSF heparin sulfate by 5%, 5.5%. <coughs> This was a more modern uh, CSF HS method uh, that is reliable. And um, whilst we did a whole pile of neurocognitive and behavioral and other outcome measures, we knew that they were not going to, in the short time period, uh, in these quite advanced patients, tell us what we needed to know. But the fact that we could only lower the CSF HS by this amount made us feel very confident, say, OK, this hasn't worked. This is important a negative result, we've been able to show that this treatment doesn't make enough of a difference to have a clinically meaningful effect on these children. And so we were able to, I hope, draw a line under this at this point. It only took us 10 years to do this study. Um, draw a line under it uh, and move on, because I think it's important to, if you're not got an effective treatment, to fail fast, uh, realize you're not working, and move on to the next thing. So we moved on to the next thing. Here's our current trial. It's a MPS3A lentiviral stem cell gene therapy study. So this is similar to the lenti ex vivo stem cell gene therapies for metachromatic leukodystrophy and for X-linked adrenal leukodystrophy. We take stem cells from a patient. Uh, we modify them in the lab, um, put them in the gene back in, um, and overexpressing that gene, so we make uh, 100 to 1,000 times more enzyme than with an allogeneic transplant. Um, and so we see uh, in this study, we have five patients, uh, all recruited under the age of two, and we followed them up for three years now that we got a dramatic reduction almost to the lower limit of detection of CSF heparin sulfate. Uh, and we've been following these kids for three years now, but we had to treat them so young. And this is what the, the 
issues were that I was trying to highlight earlier. Although we've got four out of five children here developing within the normal range, there's still only, we're still only seeing just about separation from the natural history of this disease. To be really clear, we'd need another one or two years, maybe more. And we've been in this study four or five months from bankruptcy um, the whole way through. Um, and we've seen many biotechs be in exactly the same scenario. So this kind of study, whilst maybe giving you the purest answer in the long run, is almost impossible for us to do. I will summarize. I know. <laughs> um, so I hope I've shown you, as all of our other speakers have, that the trial design and choice of trial design is incredibly challenging due to the natural history and the nature of the outcome measures we have to use in neuropathic MPS disorders. And I would suggest that the perfect or the purest study of early treatment with a very long follow-up plus a placebo group with large numbers is financially impossible and ethically entirely inappropriate. Um, so we have to find a different way. We cannot keep failing as as I have done multiple times in this disease for these patients. CSF heparin sulfate can be closely linked to cognitive benefit. Of course, you have to have caveats to that, thinking about the age of treatment. But if we are to have actual therapies for neuropathic MPS disorders, I think we must approach clinical trials very differently to how we currently do. Thank you. That is your last moment. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Jones. Uh, you owe the other two speakers two minutes. Um, next up, we have Dr. Eric Zanelli, who co-founded Alivex Corporation and was its head of research for the last five years. Dr. Zanelli, would you take us on our next step in this tour? Sure. Well, first of all, um, thank you for the uh, foundation for inviting me today. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about the uh, efficacy of uh, tralizinidase alpha, also known as EX250, for the treatment of uh, MPS3B. And I'm going to talk to you about the importance of heparin sulfate as a predictor of clinical efficacy. So actually, um, I'm not even sure I have much to add from all the great presentation we heard until now, especially uh, thank you, Dr. Jones, for your uh, presentation, because I'm pretty much going to say the same thing in a different way. <laughs> so um, just to remind you, to actually, Dr. Elion Wood already uh, talked to you about AX250 uh, and uh, doc data that uh, we published some years ago. Uh, just as a reminder, uh, AX250 is a, f is a trimer of a fusion protein made of recombinant human NAGLU. Uh, fused with a truncated version of uh, IGF-2. So this protein is uh, capable of uh, entering the cells through the mannose 6-phosphate receptor. And uh, the compound is delivered by uh, ICV administrations once a week at 300 milligrams per dose. So this is a kind of an overview of our clinical uh, development which, by the way, started back in 2016. So uh, some of these subjects have been treated now by for eight years. So we have first uh, a natural history study, was called uh, 215901, where uh, subjects were uh, observed for about one year. Most of these subjects ended up in our interventional study 250201 and they were treated for another year, and then eventually there was an extension for 240 weeks, which means again that in some cases, some of these children have been treated by now for more than six years. We also had uh, um, escalation dose arms called 250 part one, where these subjects were treated with 30, 100, or 300 milligrams of AX250 weekly. So I'm going to talk to you about cognition as a primary endpoint because it's an endpoint that has been approved by the agency as a primary endpoint in our conf confirmatory studies. I will also talk a little bit about um, the adaptive behavior using the Vinant scales. And in terms of surrogate markers, I will talk to you about cortical gray matter volumes 
and uh, CSF and plasma HSNRE as measured by an LCM SMS method, which are again, as mentioned several times already uh, during the day, the way we are measuring these heparin sulfate are disease specific. So <clears throat> this uh, first data slide is to uh, demonstrate to you what we call in drug development a target engagement, because what happened is that you have children who have uh, abnormal level of heparin sulfate, both in the CSF and plasma at baseline. We treat those children for three, four weeks, and within three, four weeks, we normalize the heparin sulfate in both CSF and plasma. And as you can see on this slide, in some cases, we have been sustaining normalization of heparin sulfate for more than five years. <clears throat> the reason that we know that it is the normalization of heparin sulfate is due to the treatment and nothing else is, because, is for two reasons. Number one, as you can see in red, we have some children who did not receive treatment for various reasons, and these children did not normalize heparin sulfate. And we have also the case of one particular subject who had the device, the, the uh, reservoir was removed for a few months because of technical issues. And during the time that the treatment was interrupted, you can see that the heparin sulfate level went above normal again. And as soon as we restarted the treatment, we renormalized heparin sulfate. So there's clearly a target engagement and the normalization of heparin sulfate is due to AX250 and nothing else. So here on this slide, we are shifting a little bit gear. We're talking about cortical gray matter volumes. Uh, we and others have shown in the past and published that in all the brain regions, the cortical gray matter volume is particularly affected very early in these children with MPS3B. So the natural history of the disease I've shown on the left with the gray dot is that in the normal disease development, past the age of eight or nine, at the latest, children with the most aggressive forms of MPS3B will have cortical gray matter volume below normal development. And on average, it happens around the age of five. As a, as a strong contrast, when we treat these children with AX250, what you can see is an initial drop in the cortical gray matter volumes, which we believe result from the elimination of the heparin sulfate that has been accumulating for years in the brain of these children. So there's an initial drop, but past this drop, there is a stabilization of cortical gray matter volume. And then in, even in some cases, the cortical gray matter volumes rebound and the volume actually increase. And what is remarkable is that in particular, we have five children who have been treated for more than six years. And by now, these children are at, are at the age of 10 or 12 years of age, and they still have normal cortical gray matter volumes. On the right, what you see is a very strong, very significant correlation between the change in cortical gray matter volumes over treatment and the cognitive age equivalent scores at the last visit, meaning that the protections, the preservation of cortical gray matter volumes predict cognitive efficacy in these children. So here on this slide, as has been mentioned several times today, obviously everybody knows that when you look at cognitions, you need to treat early to maximize clinical efficacy. So in this particular slide, we have, we have 22 children that have been treated in our clinical trials. I'm just showing you the data for eight of these children because these eight particular subjects had all of them normal cortical gray matter volumes at the time of treatment initiations. And what you can see on the left is the gray dots is a natural history of the disease. So what we know in MPS3B is that on average, children with MPS3B achieve an age equivalent scores of about 24 months 
at the age of four. And after that, in most, in most cases, the cognitions decline. What you can see here is that the children that were treated with AX250, some, some of them for more than six years, have a positive change in cortical in cognitions. They, they definitely are at minimum stable, and in some cases, definitely, definitely improving. And obviously, one child we always talk in particular is what we call 9006, who's been our champion. 9006 started the treatment when she was two years of age. By now, I believe she's must be, she must be eight and a half. She more or less has a normal cognitive development, which is obviously totally unexpected for children with MPS3B. On the right, you can see that there is a correlation between the AQ cognitive scores and the average level of H HSNRE or heparin sulfate in the CSF. So again, as you will expect, the children who are doing the best are the ones who have normalized heparin sulfate. And on the extreme right, you see this particular children, 9002, 9022, who, is, who has been doing very poorly, who actually withdrew from the study years ago because for various reasons, she was not treated with the compound. And clearly, this child had very abnormal level of heparin sulfate. So again, we've been talking a lot about cognitions and which because clearly the FDA has recognized cognition as a primary endpoint. I think what you heard this morning several times is that cognition is obviously only one aspect of the disease. I mean, the parents, the caregivers are always telling us that they are looking at a lot, lot of other things than improvement in cognitions, improvement in quality of life, improvement in sleep patterns, improvement in the way these kids are communicating. So in this particular case, I'm showing you one example, which is one particular subdomain called self-caring within the violent scale. And what you can see on the left is that the children who have been treated with AX250 for at least three years are doing a lot better in terms of adaptive behavior and self-caring than natural history children. And what you can see on the right is that in terms of biomarkers, if you combine CSF HSNRE with change in cortical gray matter volumes, what this figure is telling you is that the six children who are doing a lot better than expected from natural history are the six children who have both normalization, normalizations of CSF, heparin sulfate, and preservations of brain volume. So here, I believe, is my last slide, which is a kind of a summary of what you heard today, is that, again, if cognition is the only acceptable primary endpoint by the FDA, we will have to treat only children very early on, at, at latest, at three years of age, to be able to demonstrate cognitive benefits. Because obviously, once children have lost cortical gray matter volumes, it's going to be very difficult to prove benefit in, with AX250 or any kind of treatment. So my last slide is just to remind you that I think when we talk about a surrogate marker that is reasonably likely to predict clinical efficacy, we have to keep in mind that this statement depends on age at baseline, preservation of brain volumes, route of administrations, and clinical, clinical outcome assessment. We do believe that AX250 is a great treatment for children with MPS3B in other ways than cognitions. And we have plenty of data to demonstrate that their children are improving in terms of quality of life, in terms of sleep patterns, in terms of communications. But the agency has to accept that these clinical outcome assessment are as meaningful as cognitions for the parents and the caregivers. 
And obviously, uh, I'd like to thank all the patients, their parents, and all the clin clinical sites around the world that have been involved with this clinical trial for the last eight years. Thank you. Fabulous. Thank you, Dr. Zanelli. All right, to round out uh, what will be our last slide presentation of the day, um, we will turn now to Dr. Heather Lau, who currently serves as the Executive Director of Global Clinical Development at Ultragenics Pharmaceuticals, where she leads teams in developing therapies for pediatric patients with rare genetic diseases. Dr. Lau, let's turn to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me here. Um, in addition to my role in clinical development at Ultragenics, prior to joining industry, I in fact ran the NYU lysosomal program for nine plus years, and I was trained under Ed Kaladny. I'm a pediatric neurologist, and I've treated every subtype of MPS over the years. So I'm honored to be here to talk about our program in MPS3A, and we're showing a reduction of CSFHS exposure and correlating that to clinical outcomes. So you've seen this earlier by Dr. Jones and others. It's important to understand that this single enzyme defect leading to the deficiency of self sulfamidase leads to this triphasic course that he's explained. And I want to focus in on this positive developmental slope in those first two years, where again, it's hard to differentiate from children who are not affected. And then we start to see that arrest of development starting around 24 months and going into 48 months. Beyond 48 months, we start to see a negative developmental trajectory, and that's regression, heralding loss of skills in all domains, not just cognition, but motor and language as well. And we'll come back to that when we talk about our data. And again, so we're talking today about CSFHS as a primary disease activity biomarker for neuronopathic MPS. There are other biomarkers that are supportive of this primary marker. And it's important to understand that there is somewhat of a sequence to these events. There was a question earlier posed today, right, about you know, the downstream effects. We know that there's a whole cascade of derangements going, going on in the cell, but it starts with the first, which is HS accumulation within that lysosome. And that goes on to ca cause secondary storage of gangliosides, and then further injury to neurons. And we can measure that with neurofilament, and then to start to see the impact on brain volumes, which you heard by my colleagues here today. And in, in fact, we see a progressive degeneration over time, and those volumes are shrinking. And so those are sequential, right? But HS is occurring early in that process, and we're able to measure it in the CSF. So UX111 is designed to target the underlying sulfamidase deficiency. Its expression uh, leads to expression of a functional enzyme to clear that toxic HS. This is an AAV9 in vivo gene therapy that is administered intravenously. It delivers a full length copy of a functional sulfaminase gene. And this is under the control of a ubiquitous promoter. So we are uh, transducing a variety of cell ty types, not just brain, uh, brain cells. And we do rely on both direct transduction as well as cross correction. Again, that is something that we've leveraged in ERT for other therapies. And this therapy is under investigation for children with MPS3A. Okay, so our clinical development program, and I will say we took this over from Aviona and moved forward with this. Um, our initial trial is a dose escalation open label trial. They had three different doses, but our most recent iteration focused in on a target population. It was a younger population under two years old or over two with a developmental quotient of at least 60 or greater. For those patients, we have now treated 17 patients under that protocol. And what I really just want to show you here is that there is that first 24-month trial that rolls into a longer-term follow-up because, of course, we need to understand not only the long-term safety, but the full clinical benefit, not just on cognition, but motor and language and other domains. And so as of our last data snapshot, we have treated 28 patients. Of these, are the 17 are in our MITT. And 15 of these 17 patients have reached at least uh, 30 months of age. Six of 17 have now reached age five or beyond. So we have long-term data. And our mean duration of follow-up was anywhere from 11 to 60 months with a median duration of 28. And so, as I'm showing with others, um, we see a rapid reduction in CSFHS within the first month post-administration. 
We have a further nadir at six months and an overall reduction of 50%, of greater than 50%. And so, you know, looking at the use of secondary biomarkers, this is telling us that the threshold that we've achieved with CSFHS reduction is adequate because we're starting to see the secondary storage markers come down as well. This is the GM2 and GM3. And so that is sufficient to say that we are restoring lysosomal function, that we have had target engagement in the brain because CSF ganglioside are also coming down. Now, what you saw was a percent change from baseline. But there's another way of quantifying the toxic uh, effects of HS, and that's looking at exposure over time. Just like in other disorders like FE, phenylalanine that you heard today from Dr. Dixon, it's that accumulation of that toxic metabolite that really impacts cognitive and neurodevelopment, and it takes time to see that impact. Today's elevation does not translate to today's cognition, right? It's accumulation over time. So we are using a time nor normalized area under the curve to measure uh, our CSFHS exposure. And this uses all available CSFHS levels after treatment and not just that first and last one to get a sense of the cumulative reduction in exposure. And here we're starting to see at a group level a median exposure reduction of 63.3% over a follow-up of two years. And the table below is one patient's calculation of this time normalized area to the curve. Okay, so let's move to cognition. We have been following these patients um, now almost through five years and beyond. We are showing that um, on this graph, uh, we have our treated patients in green and our natural history, again, leveraging item level data from the Shapiro study in blue. And as others had pointed out, it's really hard to see a treatment effect between zero and 24 months. However, at 24 months and beyond, we start to see a divergence between the treated and untreated. And so we are seeing either a stabilization of cognition or improvement while the patients in the untreated cohort are declining. By 60 months, we are seeing a statistically significant difference, but it takes years to see this. And so when we look at starting from 24 months to 60 months, in our treated group, we're seeing an average of 23-point mean increase in our cognitive raw scores. This is in cognition. So this is pretty significant, but again, it took time to see. This is only one aspect. We are measuring, again, expressive and receptive language. You're not seeing that today. And other aspects of the disease are improving. So now let's put this together. Is there a correlation between CSFHS reduction and clinical outcomes? And so what we're showing here is that there is. So the upper left corner is the clustering of our patients. And so if you had a sufficient reduction of CSFHS exposure and continued gain in cognitive uh, points on the Baileys, you'd be up in that upper left. So 15 of our 17 patients are simultaneously achieving a CSFHS exposure reduction of greater than 50% and continuing to have a positive estimated yearly change in their cognitive raw scores. They're gaining skills. There are two outliers. Who are those outliers? So I have time. Let's go back and show you. Oops. There is one patient in our treated cohort that is clearly declining. And this patient is actually heralding another issue. What happened here is that the patient had a rebound in their CSFHS. You saw our median levels. There was a little uptick. Some of our patients were developing an immune response. And so what we see here is one year prior to the decline in cognition, we started to see the rebound in the CSFHS. That was telling us that there's something wrong. And that led us to look further and find that there was, in fact, an anti-SGSH enzyme response, which is not unheard of in our enzyme replacement therapies, correct? And so we saw a loss of biochemical efficacy preceding the loss of cognitive efficacy by over a year. So in fact, yes, it's not correlating together up, but this case, unfortunately, is proving the point. Our CSFHS is telling us that there's something wrong. We have one other patient who is an outlier, and right now, they're losing early biochemical efficacy, again, to developing these um, anti-SGSH antibodies, but the child has not yet declined. 
and we are intervening. So let me go forward. All right, so the late biomarker. Um, uh, this is my categorization, or uh, in, it's, you know, it's temporarily related a little bit. But thinking about preservation of brain volumes, as you heard my colleagues talk about, it takes years to say that we're stabilizing brain volume, right? It is a goal, but it's a later goal. We still have to go out to five years to show that we're not declining like the untreated, uh, untreated patients in blue. And our patients here are also showing a slight dip and then a stabilization within the normal healthy control range. And this is sustained, but the data is early. The population is still maturing. This is males, this is females. And so I would say that this is reassuring, you know, along with the gangliosides, that our therapy is having a sustained response and we still have to follow it forward. Our safety profile, just for completeness, we are seeing very mild to moderate elevations in LFTs, which is a class effect of our gene therapy, of, of gene therapy in general, and only one grade three. So overall today, in this very quick pace, we showed a correlation between the CSFHS reduction, that primary disease activity marker is rapidly reduced and sustained, and that leads to an, um, a correlation to improved cognitive outcomes over the long term. And this is supported by secondary and tertiary markers. And overall, this is, um, we are showing promising interim results, suggesting a favorable benefit risk profile of our patients um, with treatment of UX111. All right, as the last speaker, I'm gonna use one second. Okay, good. Um, so it's been a wonderful day hearing my colleagues, my mentors, and Joe Munzer and others in this field uh, really go into the, um, and educate the public about neuronopathic MPS. It has been a tall order to go from systemic uh, treatments to crossing that blood-brain barrier. We're, do, we're starting to do that. And with the advent of validated and high-precision assays, we are able to measure HS, and it provides that dynamic range, the specificity and reliability to allow the use of CSFHS as a predictive biomarker, in contrast to those less specific older gag assays, which I remember as well, because I was trained on those. The changes in CSFHS are dynamic and rapid, and it's telling us that we are achieving our goal. We're achieving and crossing the blood-brain barrier. And as you saw from Dr. Jones, it helps us understand if we're achieving biochemical efficacy or failure, and allows us to fail fast. And that informs the clinical development program. In contrast, the clinical outcomes, which are critical to parents and caregivers, they really do want to see an impact on motor, language, behavior, um, but it takes years to fully realize. It also depends on the age of intervention. I showed you a target population, but we're looking at our entire population and pulling the data to understand the true effect. Now, again, greater effect, earlier you treat, but there is still an impact if we stabilize this fatal disease, right? And that is important to our parents and caregivers. So the totality of evidence provided today, both preclinically and clinically, really does support the role of CSFHS as a biomarker reasonably likely to predict clinical outcomes. And pursuing an accelerated pathway using this HS as this endpoint is critical to really move forward the development of life-saving therapies for these groups of diseases. So with that, I want to say thank you to my team and to the parents and caregivers of our patients. Okay. So I have a few that are discrete for speakers, although you should obviously feel free to chime in if you'd like, but some of them are, are very specific and then others are, are more open-ended. Um, but Dr. Bulos, there was a discrete one to you. There was a, a discrete question about what method was used for heparin sulfate measurement in the work that you presented. It's an LCMS method. Okay. Um, did we get that? Could you hear her? Uh, yeah, go ahead. If you just okay, repeat it. Okay, it was an LCMS-based method. Okay, great. Uh, then there was one other one that was very specific. Well, rather specific. So Dr. Zanelli, um, thinking about your best performer in your study, do you th what would you say about the very early age and whether that was a contributing factor? <coughs> oh, yeah, definitely. She... Uh... She was enrolled in the study. She started a treatment at two years of age. 
uh, is no doubt that if we have started the treatment later, she would have done much less well. Okay. Well. Very helpful. Dr. Dixon, welcome. I will say you should just unmute and jump in um, the same as our other panelists. And I think, yes, you can see that you appear above all of them. Um, so you have equal, equal standing um, on the stage. Uh, so to Dr. Ellenwood, um, do the dogs show the behavior changes seen in children? And are the therapies ever used to help the dogs? Uh, interesting question. I, I, a lot of the literature describes children as being violent, aggressive, et cetera. I don't think those are accurate. I think they have difficulty with impulse control and frustration and will be destructive, et cetera, because of that. Um, we see none of that in the dogs. They are super chill and very friendly. Uh, because they're a social species, they always get housed with roommates. The only thing I've ever seen is affected roommates uh, if you took one away to do something, they got very agitated. They love their buddies, and they want to be reunited with them. But we saw no mm. aggression. Uh, we don't treat the dogs, but by identifying the disease, we can test for them. And this particular disease in Skipper Keys was found to have a carrier rate of 20%, and it has basically been eliminated. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Dr. Dixon, one for you. Does your experiment confirm that CSFHS changes are due to changes in the brain and do not reflect changes in the periphery? So what we were able to observe is that um, when we administered treatment that corrected the systemic compartment to the point where we observed a reduction in serum heparin sulfate, we did not also observe a CS reduction in CSF heparin sulfate, um, and vice versa. If we treated neuron, brain neurons, we did observe a reduction in both brain and CSF heparin sulfate and did not observe a reduction in serum heparin sulfate. So it would point to a conclusion such as that. So um, that, that would be as, about as far as what I can say our data show. All right, thank you. Um, let me make sure that I am get hitting everyone with a specific question, and then we'll go to some of the, the broader ones. Um, Dr. Jones, could you expand on the point that uh, the patient that did not respond in the trial, um, in that there, just expand on the point that uh, I think there was one patient who had a CSFHS level that did not then correlate to cognitive development. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a fair point. Um, so uh, there's one patient who hasn't shown uh, normal cognitive development in our lentiviral stem cell gene therapy trial. In, interestingly, the, um, yet they, they had the same characteristics. We couldn't find any, any different characteristics. They were treated at the right time. Um, there weren't higher antibodies. The vector copy number was similar. Um, uh, interestingly, when we've looked at the brain volumes, which I didn't show, that her um, brain volume was maintained just the same as the other children. And what she shows is a really quite autistic behavioral phenotype. Um, and now, many people say that San Filippo children have autistic-like behaviors, but that's, that's only an approximation of the behavioral deficit in San Filippo. Um, uh, the parents of this child actually have an older child with San Filippo who's been untreated, and they say that the two children are completely different. And so uh, we uh, see this uh, also in a number of MPS1 and MPS2 children who've had bone marrow transplant. Some of them develop a profound autistic feature um, or phenotype. Um, so I, I think that's a disease-related manifestation. And the CSF heparin sulfate is, um, correlates well with the maintenance of brain volume and with the prevention of regression. But the problem is that the autistic behavioral phenotype means that we cannot measure her cognition in a way that would be right. helpful. I mm -hmm. think that's our current interpretation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I saw a head yeah. nods. Did anybody want to add anything? No, there? I mean, Please. Simon and I talked about this. this. The cognition is a high bar to measure in children. So if they're not able to comply with the, the assessment, then you might have a falsely sense a false low. Um, but I think the critical aspect here is that this child is, is, is acting differently than their sibling, their older sibling. And so you can't expect a child to uh, have every single domain um, respond, potentially, and maybe you're holding them in that study without reg regression, or the lack of regression is, is a goal in a therapy, in a treatment for a 
neurodegenerative disease. It, that is the goal. So it'll be interesting to follow forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Picking up off on the theme of siblings, I wanted to ask Eric, were there any siblings in your study that entered uh, treatment at different ages? Uh, if there were, do you know about them and can you comment on their differential responses potentially? <clears throat> yes, well, we have one, one case actually, uh, so 9006, so so-called champion. Uh, she has a brother that has been treated also in our studies, but the treatment started a year later in age equivalence, and uh, clearly he's been doing a lot better than you would expect on the natural history, but he's definitely not doing as well as his younger sister. Okay. Uh, Dr. Lyle, there, one for you, you used a phrase of pr uh, primary disease activity biomarker, um, but that's not the word, th those are not the, t the typical way to describe, at least in a regulatory perspective, response biomarker <laughs> or surrogate endpoint. Did you mean something else? Or, or tell us how those might connect. I feel like we were all using that term today, the proximal I, I know, I heard it on yours and saw it on the slide. Ah. Uh, so so I, I think the concept of early and late, it's, it's relative, it's not exact timing, but it's sequ sequential. So. Mm -hmm. So when we think about it, heparin sulfate, especially in 3A, B, C, and D, they only accumulate HS, and so HS is the most proximal or primary to the genetic defect, mm -hmm. right? So the genetic defect causes the enzyme deficiency, leads to HS storage, then a downstream, a, a, you know, whole host of downstream events. So that's what I'm using as a primary disease activity. Um, you know, if you start targeting and, and monitoring neuroinflammatory markers, that could be confounded by other treatments, such as immunosuppression in the therapy, right, uh, that are co-administered. So really and truly, if I can affect HS, then I'm affecting the primary disease state. If I'm treating neuroinflammation as a neurologist, mm -hmm. I can actually temporarily treat neuroinflammation with a whole host of medications, but I'm not getting to the root cause. Mm -hmm. And the root cause here is a single enzyme defect with substrate deposition. So. Forgive me, I'm not a regulatory person. Oh, no, I, but I think it was for clarity, right? <laughs> okay. Just in the, in that's, the, yeah, that's how it, it, it's, um, you know, as we know in the FDA space, there are a, a lot of people who are trained as lawyers. I'm one of them, right? And then, so there's, there's magic language that's, uh, it, and so that was a magic language question uh, in needing the connection of, of, of the words there. Um, so let me, uh, this this may be then uh, somewhat related, so this is, is to any of you, but um, it, speaking specifically on the gene therapy or the intrathecal um, ERTS, any thoughts on how immunogenicity to products might be affecting cerebrospinal HS levels and in turn efficacy? Um, so I've seen that in both um, enzyme trials and, and, and other and in gene therapy trials, so I think antibodies can be an issue. I think um, uh, what we've learned from intravenous ERT is if you wait for a clinical outcome, you may, uh, or an attenuated clinical response due to antibodies, then you may wait five to 10 years to see that and know for sure, which of course is completely too late uh, if you want to actually manage that response. I think we have many tools now to manage an immune response. I think we, we shouldn't be scared of talking about it. It's a, it's a natural thing, it, we should expect it. Uh, and we should be tr striving to make every child respond to our therapy. I think that's deeply important. We've got a small N in our trials, and uh, we've got difficult outcome measures um, and difficult timing. So we have to make sure that we give every child the best chance to respond as fully as they possibly can, which for some children may, may mean we have to use immune modulatory strategies, as Heather has mentioned. And I don't think we should be afraid, afraid or indeed apologize for that. I think we, we mm -hmm. need to do whatever we need to do to get kids to respond. Yeah. Uh, very helpful. And so, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, maybe I can add. Uh, so in our case, I mean, we do see antibodies formations in most of the kids. Uh, we, there is no evidence that the antibodies are interfering on the efficacy. And I would say that probably what's happening is that after a while, there is a kind of an immune tolerance. Mm. So the antibody titers tend to decrease. Okay. I'd yes, like please. to follow up. So for that case that I showed in our program, that child looking back probably had something called CRIM status, a CRIM status that was CRIM uh, negative, right? So 
in lysosomal world, we understand that CRIM status is very important in understanding antibody-mediated loss of efficacy. And so that's something that's mitigated by immune suppression. So CRIM status in that patient, that their, their titers were in the three million. So that was um, heralding a response by losing the enzyme and then leading to reaccumulation of HS. CSFHS is not directly being taken out of circulation by antibodies or affected by the, it's a, it's a marker that the enzyme is being attacked mm -hmm. in our case. But we do see um, CRIM status is important to understand when you're embarking on gene therapy and other therapies. Mm -hmm. uh, two points, uh, most of the dogs develop peripheral antibodies uh, to the compound that we studied, but it did not seem to impact the efficacy in the CNS. And correct me if I'm wrong, Simon, but the study that you and Milan have conducted on ex vivo gene therapy for MPS1 involving autologous transplant and lead T therapy actually removed the antibody response that children had had if they'd been previously put on ERT. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. And rituximab was used um, in, in everybody as a kind of prophylactic immune response because most of them were sensitized by enzyme initially, enzyme therapy. And post, ther uh, post therapy, that was gone. That settled on, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Dr. So Dixon, I saw your hand raised. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, so in our, in our preclinical studies, mainly the MPS1 dogs, we do see a reduction in efficacy in the animals that developed uh, antibodies against the enzyme. However, it didn't eliminate efficacy, and there was still, a, uh, it, it was still better treated, they're just the ones that didn't have antibodies had an additional benefit, in, if you want to think about it that way, compared to those that did. Okay. So anything else on that? Well, the goal is tolerization. Let's just highlight that. <laughs> and that's what we're seeing as well in some patients. So your immune system can calm down and you start to tolerate to that. So mm -hmm. that's what we're probably seeing as well. All right, now this one is um, specific on the gene therapy study. What do you hypothesize studies, or discussion of gene therapies, rather, what do you hypothesize regarding durability of response? And if the clinical effect wanes, could ERT be used thereafter? I think we can draw from hemophilia studies. I think hemophilia have shown the longest durability in terms of gene therapy. Um, so we expectation are, of course, in our specific gene therapies, we have to follow them long term. Um, but the expectations are that, um, with it being, um, you know, pediatric patients, that there should be um, some carryover for for um, expression in long term. But our studies are still young and mature. But if we draw from hemophilia, I think we have um, uh, hope that they would be durable. Mm -hmm. From a neurologist perspective, neur neurons don't divide, right? We're, we essentially are born with the same complement of neurons that we go on. There is some neurogenesis over time, and most of the remodeling occurs in, in synapse formation, right? So if we're targeting neurons, hopefully we would see durability, but I would have to caveat that we've only followed it for five years. So hopefully, unlike other high turnover cells, uh, the cells that are highly turning over, we hope to have durability in the brain. Mm -hmm. Simon, do you have any? You have a different I, modality. I, mean, I think the in vivo and ex vivo approaches are quite different. We deliberately target in yeah. an ex vivo, rapidly dividing cells, um, mm. but we target the stem cells, yeah. knowing that, and, and we integrate uh, to the genome, knowing that we, that should then allow us to express for, in a lifelong way. But of course, we're all still learning, and the longest sort of lenty kids are um, not in our study, but in other diseases are sort of uh, 15 years out. Right. I think the lessons from primates where they've treated animals with AAV targeting the neuroretina, uh, non-dividing neural tissue, uh, those uh, persist for out to eight years, which is the longest I think they've been studied. Now there's about 50 questions there, so that's a good thing. <laughs> um, so how do you tell if the patients with clinical improvement are secondary to treatment, or is it because they have slowly progressive disease? Um, well, I think everyone's tackling this slightly differently. On our lentiviral trial, um, we, uh, as part of our inclusion criteria, had the patients had to be under one year, but we also had an ind independent uh, expert who would review the patient's case history and genotype. And we had to be absolutely sure that they were of a severe or rapidly progressive phenotype before we could include them. And we rejected some patients on the basis that they weren't part of that. So, um, yeah, obviously, if you get them very, very young, they're sort of oligo were pre-symptomatic, mm -hmm. so you have to have another way of predicting their phenotype 
Um, so that, that was our approach. But. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, I would say in our case, number one, in, in some cases, we followed uh, what shown for so many years that if we still see an improvement, I believe it has to be a deviation from natural history. And the second thing is obviously, as I show you, is that in some cases, we know that if the child is not getting treatment, he or she doesn't normalize the parent sulfate and he starts losing brain volume. So clearly, I have to believe that the children with normalized parent sulfate, preservation of brain volumes, and improving cognitions are the result of treatment and nothing mm -hmm. else. Mm -hmm. It's not a perfect correlation, but we did also exclude some attenuated phenotypes that are known, or genotypes that are known for MPS3A. But again, it is difficult, but as you can see, there's the, the main is rapid progressors. We, we've enriched for the rapid progressors. But it doesn't mean that slow progressors who are slower would benefit or not, would not benefit. It mm -hmm. just might be different. And mm -hmm. so the HS at baseline is what is important. If we're following the metabolite, then, um, and we see preservation over time. But again, that would take years. Mm -hmm. and, and, right. And, and. Right. Uh, a specific question, um, Dr. Zanelli, how frequently did you measure heparin sulfate in the cerebrospinal, cerebrospinal fluid? And did you see a correlation between the decrease in the biomarker and the frequency of the infusions? <laughs> that's, that's a very good question. Uh, I could talk about it for the next two hours. <laughs> yeah, we don't have that. <laughs> so, no, the, the, the short answer is that, uh, so the way we do it is that every week when the subject comes to the clinic for treatment, we have to remove 10 milliliters of CSF. So I can, I can tell you that for each child, I've been a trial for eight years, we have a lot of CSF. So if we want, we could measure every week. So we are, I can tell you, I mean, we have thousands of data points. Mm -hmm. And so to the second part of the question, yes, it is interesting. That's why we believe that after a few years, after actually one year of treatment, we can go to every other week dosing or even, even less because we do know that after a while, when you've been able to sustain normalization of heparin sulfate, if the child doesn't get treatment for a few weeks, he or she still maintain normalization of heparin sulfate. It takes, mm. it takes a few weeks before you start seeing a rebound. Okay. Uh, at least one of you mentioned SMA in comparison to uh, MPS. Uh, so to extend that comparison, what can we learn from SMA as to what drug approval could mean to MPS and similar disorders? I don't know about the others. I know I mentioned SMA. So SMA was uh, approved for a therapy in 2016. Within two years, we had it listed uh, on the federal recommended uniform screening panel for newborn screening. Uh, that was in uh, the summer of 2018. This January, we got to 100% of the United States screening for this disorder in newborns. So in a very short time, we've gone from a drug approval to universal screening in the United States, and we now have three approved therapies for SMA. So there is benefit systematically to the whole uh, drug development landscape and diagnostic landscape from just one approval uh, that could accrue to many of these disorders. Mm -hmm. SMA is different, though. Uh, yes, agree. Where Nick Hoffman is an early infantile disease that has rapid progression to death. Right, so we're, we're talking rapid progression and slow progression in MPS. It's relative, right? We're talking years, decades, which is still too fast for our families. But it's different than um, the early infantile diseases that are rapid progression. And so you'll see difficulties with the more attenuated phenotypes um, of, of SMA. But the SMA that it was based on, their, their endpoints are faster. They, they come to those faster. But from a public health standpoint, yes. getting an approval opens up newborn screening. Absolutely. That will recruit more patients. That creates a better drug development uh, 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 landscape if new competitors want to come in, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, additionally, from getting kids diagnosed and treated. Yeah. Um, there's a question here now on uh, measuring cognition. Uh, and Heather, it's tagged to you, but that doesn't mean that you need to take it. Uh, but when measuring cognition, what are you using after patients get to 42 months? And how do you transition between the Bailey and something else 
and measure cognitive growth as a continuum across that age. Oh, I'll start, but I think Dr. Zanelli can talk about this as well. So obviously, our um, when it's a wonderful problem to deal with. If our children are reaching mm -hmm. the ceiling of the Baileys, for, for example, um, and then they'll bridge over to the Kaufmans. Um, but that is the part of the lack of flexibility we have here, mm -hmm. is that when we're showing that children are, are excelling or, or achieving higher and higher cognitive um, uh, milestones, we can't use those, um, we can't use those interchangeably according to the FDA currently. I'm being delicate here. But as a neurologist, if a child is walking and talking, it doesn't matter the measurement. Mm -hmm. The child is walking and talking and they're not declining. So that's mm -hmm. the, that's, so how do we, we need help in understanding how to bridge that. And Eric, do you want to talk a little bit about your program? <coughs> sure. Um, I mean, our colleague from the FDA in the room know that the agency wants us to use raw score instead of mm. age equivalent. The point with raw score is that the raw score for Bailey and Kaufman are totally different. Mm. So to head a point, the point is that when a child achieves a score of 88 on the Bailey scale, when then we are stuck <laughs> to for, to all lack of better world. So all we can do is to keep the maximum score as a reference or try to switch to uh, age equivalent. Mm -hmm. But then because then there is an equivalence between the Bailey and the Kaufman scales, or my other uh, favorite topic of discussion is to use the violence scale, mm -hmm. because the violence you can use the raw score for the whole child, regardless of age. Mm -hmm. Okay. You, you gave me a, a, an inartful metaphor that when the child jumps over, it, it's appear that right, they've got over the high jump, but then we stopped um, measuring how high they could jump. Oh, they're, exactly. they're far, That's far over. Is, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, back to animal model uh, to make sure that we, we don't lose that. Uh, to what degree are the animal models able to recapitulate the human MPS disease, for instance, the MPS3 dogs? So the MPS3 dogs have a fatal neurodegenerative disease. Uh, in that regard, I would say they are great models. They show atrophy of a major component of the central nervous system, the cerebellum. It is different in that it is early adult onset. It is not a model of attenuated disease. It's severe canine disease. Uh, and it is primarily cerebellar instead of cerebral. With those caveats, I think it's an excellent model. It's the same basic neuropathology in terms of heparin sulfate causing fatal neurodegenerative disease. It is a large sulcated brain, only one order of magnitude the size of humans versus uh, three orders of magnitude smaller in the mouse. Uh, I think it's an excellent model. Um, uh, for some of these diseases, where large animal models like this exist, I would propose that the FDA consider animal-only rules for this. Mm. Can, I, can I just say as well that, that actually even the mice have a really good correlation with human disease. I mean, obviously, when you're scaling up, it's better to use a dog. Yep. But, but you know, the mice have it with 3A and 3B have a behavioral phenotype that mirrors the patient's and 3C, Jill. Yes, um, uh, and that really mirrors the patient. And, okay, Andy. Um, <laughs> uh, mirrors the patients that we spent a long time showing that the mice, just like the patients, have a defect in circadian rhythm. They don't sleep when they should be sleeping. Um, they don't have a sense of danger when they should have a sense of danger, and they have overactivity like the patients. So, um, there's a you know the, the, the animal models for this disease are really really good. Actually, I mentioned it earlier. Even emus die from a fatal uh, uh, spinocerebellar ataxia. Uh, these compounds kill every large vertebrate that stores it. Hmm. Uh, I think that the power of your videos is what's driving the, the, the dog questions, but they're very helpful. Um, uh, Dr. Zanelli, a discreet question. Um, there was just a, a question about what's the status of the of your current program. <laughs> well, I mean, we, we, we're not here to discuss about business. Uh, all, all, all I can tell you, very practically speaking, is that we have uh, a meeting with the FDA on March 15th, so 
<laughs> we'll see. Okay. I will tell you on March 16th where we are. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, since we have no parents up here, and I've spoken to some recently, this program cessation has been just gut-wrenching mm -hmm. and devastating. Mm -hmm. They are looking at consigning their children to a long, slow death if this does not resume. Um, which I promised I would ask. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and I will have a yes or no question that we had someone tee up for us, um, but we'll, we'll hold that for the last one. Um, let's... Uh, so, so uh, a group, I don't think that any of you mentioned this, but if you are aware of FDA's new Genetic Metabolic Diseases Advisory Committee, which I imagine you are, any thoughts on how that might have a role in this case study? It's okay to say no thoughts, although, Matthew, you are just <laughs> there, there to say something. Let me know if you want me to save you and move on, and I will. Uh, uh, I think that this new advisory committee is just perfectly set up to address this kind of issue. Uh, I, I feel for the FDA. This is an organization uh, with people of great goodwill, but 10,000 rare diseases. How do you wrap your hand around all of those? Mm -hmm. And having a committee that can come to the table and say, actually, this is a pretty easy call, or this is complex, we need some help here. Getting clinical expertise that can address the variety of these different disorders, uh, that's going to be so hugely helpful, I think, for mm -hmm. all of these review committees. And I, I'm sympathetic. If you, don't have, if you haven't spent a quarter of a century or more in these diseases, it, it could be difficult to figure it out. So mm -hmm. this committee can bridge that. Very good answer. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you have a thumbs up in the, uh, from, from the panel here. Um, so this is a, let's talk a little bit about uh, accelerated approval, right, and, and a component that that is also then tied to a requirement of confirming clinical benefit post-approval. Mm -hmm. So uh, what do you think that might look like, given the various challenges you've all shared with designing clinical trials and, and some of the components? And um, is there confidence that a well-designed trial that cannot be done pre-approval pre -approval could be done post-approval? Um, thank you. You're, you're <laughs> sitting closest to me, so, yeah. so you yeah. get to jump on that one. No, I think, it, I think it's a really important question. Um, if there were more accelerated approvals in this disease area, then mm. it, it's absolutely critical for us to be able to do trials that um, post-approval can answer the questions. Um, believe me, I'm, I'm a clinician primarily before a researcher, and so I need the questions to be answered as well as the FDA or anybody else, the patients. Uh, we all want the questions to be answered. Uh, it's important for all of us. So uh, I think there's no doubt that some of the disease registries that were post-marketing mm -hmm. pharmacovigilance requirements in the past weren't done with the aim of answering questions. They were um, not in the scientific method, if you like. They were open-ended, observational. They just collected data without setting up a hypothesis and structuring the program to answer or solve that hypothesis. So I think uh, we need to change the mentality around uh, post-marketing um, studies and make them proper studies that can actually answer those questions. I think the advent of more numbers, um, which you will get in a post-marketing situation and a longer time period, um, uh, allow you to ask those questions in a very different way. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I think it's absolutely mm -hmm. possible. I'll add to that. I, so I. Again, as a clinician first and someone who followed these patients and, and, and met with them yearly to see how they're responding to their ERT, what, what, whatever disease state, I took care of a lot of different types of lysosomal storage disorders. And you know, for one case, is the registries are retrospective. They're limited, right? Um, so I was involved as first as a PI for MEPSEVI for MPS7 in a disease monitoring program. And so again, you're, you're, you're able to do this um, collect clinical trial grade data information over time and, and um, do that in larger numbers because now more children mm -hmm. are having access to therapy. And we are committed to following up, especially in a gene therapy for safety, long-term safety, five, 10 years. 
So it's not just about not having the right tools. It's that the tools that we have right now can't measure in two years, right? We, we need to see changes not, on, not only on cognition, but motor behavior, understanding item level, like looking at the different items that are how the children are performing at that subdomain level on a cognitive scale. Are they maintaining um, certain activities of daily living? But you can do that. We, we are committed to a confirmatory uh, study to follow up, right? Uh, and to get clinical trial grade information. Mm -hmm. the, uh, you know, I, I've published off of registries. They are important. I did that for a variety of uh, diseases out there. But that data is limited, right? So mm -hmm. if we can prospectively define it and agree on it, it can be done. And you'll get the numbers because now other children are getting treated in the meantime, right? Mm -hmm. Our limitations are the small n now waiting before we can enroll more, right? Mm -hmm. So that is a, that's a key that's, difference in the preclinical and, and the postclinical. Post that's the, the barrier mm -hmm. is that we can't continue dosing patients um, pre uh, pre approval, right? It's 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 prohibitive. We need that post marketing ability to do mm -hmm. to follow and, and to treat others so they're not waiting these children are dying they are have are, they are sustaining irreversible brain damage while we're trying to prove the confirmatory right mm -hmm. so accelerated pathway my understanding is that we show that there's a biochemical engagement in HS dropped and that we're going to come back and show you over the ensuing five six mm -hmm. seven years mm -hmm. I don't know if anyone else can add to that well, I mean, I mean, in our case, I think we've been very clear. We already uh, we agree with the agency that if we get a path to accelerated approval, we will initiate the recruitment of subject in our confirmatory study as soon as possible. And mm -hmm. by the time we have accelerated approval, mm -hmm. the uh, recruitment should be complete. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's critical that any labeling must address the ability of a drug to both prevent and treat signs of disease. And it should be broad in terms of age, similar to what's been done recently for ERT and manacidosis, and not narrow for some of the recent drug approvals for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. We've got to have the ability to recruit those preclinical children, especially mm -hmm. when we get newborn screening. It may make the statistical evaluation of the outcomes more complex, but I mean, you can use mixed model approaches, et cetera. But we do need that broad approval as well as for indication uh, and age, as well as accelerated approval. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have a, a discrete question for Dr. Dixon, and then I'm going to go to the, the yes and no as our, our last question. Um, so, Dr. Dixon, does the reduction of CSF-HS in patients' brain in your 2010 study suggest that intravenous enzyme therapy does, in fact, cross the blood-brain barrier, at least in MPS1? So, um, there was a... I just want to make sure that we're talking about the same thing. So the, the, there was a 2010 study looking at canine brain. Um, not, yeah, I think they mistyped. Brain. Sorry. Yes. Oh, Go ahead. OK. Just want to make sure. And then there was a 2020 study looking at CSF, heparin sulfate, in the um, original patients treated with um, intravenous enzyme replacement therapy. So um, my interpretation of the data, uh, and again, you know, it could be correct or not correct, interpretation of the data is that it does cross a blood-brain barrier, but that the levels are very small. Um, on the order of what we've measured in the brain is about 2 to 4% of normal in the animal studies. Um, that amount may not be sufficient for full clinical impact. Um, is there any clinical impact? There, I, think there prob I think there probably is, to be honest. Um, but is that the ideal clinical impact? No. Very helpful. Now to the yes, no question, which has five parts. Oh. <laughs> so there are a lot of caveats in this question. And Can't be it, is a, no. it, it, is, it is a, well, it, 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 it has, it has, it has just has five, five caveats and that the request is for everyone to have a yes or no. Um, and it, it gets to whether reduction of HS and CSF is reasonably likely to predict stabilization of cognitive decline. So now you know where I'm headed. If started before age two, so first condition, is reduction of HS in CSF reasonably likely to predict stabilization of cognitive decline 
in greater than 80% of patients for three to five years or more in MPS3. And you could choose to answer yes or no to the first part of the question and uh, leave off the 80% if you so choose. Thoughts? Well, I, I mean, based You're on the, stuck. Now everyone knows not to sit in this chair. Um, <laughs> based on the data we have, yeah, I would say yes. Uh, it's reasonably likely to predict. Um, and uh, there, there's a, there are, of course, multiple caveats, but yeah. I would say yes. All right, yes with asterisks, which is perfectly acceptable. That's, uh, if the endpoint is cognitions, the answer is yes. If you start early, you normalize CSFHS, you will achieve clinical efficacy. Mm -hmm. Based on the model data and the clinical data from my colleagues, without any doubt, yes. Yes, absolutely. We know heparin sulfate is there. We know it's not going to go away, so we know it will be predictive. Of, yeah. Yeah, and with those caveats as well, I agree. Uh, Dr. Dixon, you get the final word. Um, I think, you know, it's in the spirit of which that question, you know, is, is asked and what it, we think it is probably means, uh, yes. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime you can introduce even more asterisks, it's okay, because we know we're still exploring, right? right. We are still yeah. learning. We are still exploring, but I hope... We know from this discussion that we, we are learning more and, and making advances. So with that, let's thank our speakers uh, for this afternoon. Uh, I can't, not. So as I noted, we are shifting from slides. We are now moving from slides to, uh, to panel discussion among this, this August group here. So we are turning to this group to help us synth synthesize what we've heard today and move us back toward that larger inquiry of biomarkers. Um, and let's say hello to our panelists who are joining us. So we have, as I come down this way, uh, John Crowley with Amicus Therapeutics and Soon to be Bio. Um, 12 more days, yes. All right, Soon to be Bio. Dr. Kara O'Neill with the Cure San Filippo Foundation. Dr. Sherry Fathy, um, I got it right, right? Cherie, okay. that's right. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, so Cherie Fathy from uh, FDA's Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research. Uh, then next to me here is Dr. Edward Nealon, Nealon from the National Organization of Rare Disorders. And then we turn to Dr. Carol Ho with Denali Therapeutics and Dr. James Wilson from the University of Pennsylvania. And then we should have, do we have our remote? Andy's in front of me, <laughs> there we go. Dr. Imperato, would you like to say hello? And it's Imperato. I'm uh, hi, practiced hi, it four times. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Hi, everyone. All right. Thank you for joining us remotely and keeping your respiratory virus to yourself. Um, <laughs> just uh, we understand the importance of doing that. So we want to talk about challenges in qualifying biomarkers to support rare disease approvals, although I have to say, you know, we've heard quite a lot of that uh, today. Um, but let's step out from the case study and have each of our panelists provide some reflections on the discussions and uh, help us think about where we should focus our attention. Uh, Dr. Wilson, I'm going to turn to you and ask you, if you reflect on your research and experience in rare genetic diseases, would you kick us off by providing your thoughts and experience in qualifying biomarkers to support approval of interventions to treat rare disease? Sure. Well, uh, happy to. And, and again, thank you for being here. Um, I run the Orphan Disease Center at Penn, and I've worked in the area of gene therapy for 40 years. Made the decision about 15 years ago after we had discovered a new family of vectors uh, for CNS disease that storage diseases may be the easiest to treat and the ones that we focused on. We, and and, and what, what we have been developing and, and, and something that we may want to consider is not only uh, MPS diseases in this context, uh, but, but consider how we can leverage this experience other diseases. And, and that's what we've tried to do in putting together a platform where we use basically the same capsid at the same route of administration and the same manufacturing. And back 15 years ago, I met a number of you in, uh, in the field, ML and Mark and others, and we made the decision we would start at MPS diseases uh, in terms of the larger uh, group of storage diseases. And the reason was, uh, reflecting on what Matt and Patty had said, is there were some very good large animal models of these diseases. 
that was really important for us to validate dosing and, and also pharmacology and toxicology. Uh, and the other one was the hope that there could be a biomarker for all of them. So that was 15 years ago, so I'm pretty excited to be here. And I hope, uh, I hope that decision was right. <laughs> but, um, but, then, but then consider uh, moving uh, the platform through those diseases into other storage diseases. So we, we founded the company Regenix Bio and did the work to support uh, an application of this platform for MPS1. We heard the great data in MPS2. Um, and then founded a company, Passage Bio, to take on gangliocytosis, storage diseases, uh, early infantile, very severe diseases, uh, GM1, CREB-A, and MLD. Uh, worked with Amicus uh, on uh, MPS3A and 3B. So we now have brought uh, four of those into the clinic. We have 11 uh, pre preclinical data sets. And, and, and I thought it'd be useful just to sort of share uh, uh, our experience in terms of whether there's any read through from preclinical to clinical and then, and then across programs. And, and we talk about animal models, and generally animal models are not very good. But what was really surprising here is how good animal models are, not only cats and dogs, but mice, in terms of scaling and also in terms of uh, correlation of biomarkers, pathology, and survival. Now, what you can do in an animal model is, is you can get statistics, you can look at clinical, and you can correlate biomarkers with, um, uh, with histology as well. Um, and, um, and that uh, seems to read through to what is being seen in the clinic. The most complete data sets are MPS1, MPS2, and GM1, and, uh, and one patient dosed in, in, uh, uh, for CREB-A. So I'll just, just uh, end with some final comments about reflecting on that experience uh, is um, you know, sort of what is a playbook uh, as I think about it. And, and for MPS diseases, the benefit, uh, which I hope we can all realize, is having a common a biomarker. And that would be enormous in terms of us taking a platform through all of these diseases. The others are bespoke, but they're all substrates. And it turns out that uh, when there is a defect, uh, an accumulation of substrate has been really a pretty good predictor preclinically of what you see uh, from a clinical perspective. Um, I also think that we've completely thought about preclinical data uh, in, in drug development. We used to think about animal studies as IND enabling. I don't know if anyone's heard that, mm -hmm. uh, that mm -hmm. allow a support of an, I, uh, of an IND. We now talk about them as BLA enabling. So in other words, how can we structure those preclinical studies, which may mean just sort of slight modifications of what you measure, so that when you complete those studies, you not only have safe to proceed to get into the clinic, but you position the program so that when you get to the point where, wow, this is really looking well, that you could leverage the animal studies uh, to support that this biomarker would predict clinical uh, benefit uh, Matt was as bold to say that animal um, uh, data may be sufficient, but, uh, but I think that's, that's the kind of spirit uh, there. Um, correlation of biomarkers with disease severity, we, uh, we, we saw that with MPS2, and, and absolutely critical, and I know uh, many of those involved in the patient advocacy uh, groups, we really need to get our act together and consolidate natural history data not only mm -hmm. from one center, but, but, but from others, so that we can proceed with, with, um, um, with an open label study, uh, and as best as we can, despite the fact there's heterogeneity, uh, convince ourselves, FDA and others, uh, uh, for, for an accelerated approval pathway. Uh, one, one, one final comment, and so I'm a scientist, I've been at Penn, and, but, but, but there's another uh, concern uh, that I'd like, it'd be great to talk about once we get through the speakers. And that is, um, let's say we do succeed and we get accelerated approval on these diseases based on biomarkers. At the, at the end of the day, this has to be a successful business model. Mm -hmm. And for it to be a successful business model, I think where the war is gonna be won is not with health authorities, it's <coughs> with those that reimburse. So if we come forward with an FDA approval and say, aha, we have this biomarker correction, are the payers that are going to say, okay, we're going to pay, and maybe this goes beyond our, our remit here, but, uh, but, um, 
And I'm sure Peter Marks and his colleagues at FDA don't have anything to say about that. <laughs> and maybe we need to bring them into the room. But, but that, at that point, we'd be all dressed up and nowhere to go. Mm -hmm. So that's a mm -hmm. thought that maybe later on we can talk about. Right. And it, it is a reality of, you know, the, the, with the promise of, of getting to that, that there's the regulator decision, which is the first, well, a, the major gatekeeper. But then there's a dynamic beyond that. Mm -hmm. Um, so any thoughts and reaction to the, the commentary about an animal model being BLA enabling or this, the com components as it relates to natural history that, that any of the panelists want to jump in on? Yeah, sure. I'd love to just add to that because I think particularly in these disease areas where the biology is very simple and very well understood, animal models can be actually very good at understanding the relationship between these biomarkers in different compartments of the animal, such as looking at the CSF, looking at the brain, and looking at the periphery, where you can make these very clear correlations that in humans you cannot do that. So it is ethically not acceptable to take biopsies of the brain, which is one of the major challenges I think we've had in this area in demonstrating, for example, biomarkers that can be collected in CSF or in the periphery are reflecting what's happening in the brain. But I think what we heard today is that there is consensus that there are biomarkers, CSF, HS, that can be measured in the CSF and do reflect what's in the brain, and that is um, very much supported by the animal model data. I think the animal model data can also correlate those biomarker changes with clinical outcomes in the animals, which are very helpful for dose selection when we go into the clinic, so that we can make sure that we're going to the do in, into the clinic with a dose that makes sense, because as we heard, patients are waiting, and these trials take a long time. Mm -hmm. And Susan, maybe I'll just emphasize the second point of what Jim discussed, and that's the importance of natural history studies. If we're going to be doing these studies where placebo controls are impractical or oftentimes largely unethical, we're going to need to have robust natural history studies. When parents and families call me and they ask what can we do, particularly in these diseases where there is very little research in an advanced stage going on, I always tell them two things. One educate the community, find more people like you, find more children, more people living with this disease. You're gonna help them, you're gonna educate them, and you'll help we as drug developers enable the studies that we need to do. And then the second thing is um, work with your communities, your key opinion leaders, researchers, the whole ecosystem to build those natural history studies because that's what ultimately I think is gonna be an incredibly powerful tool for, tool for us doing these studies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, let me turn now, um, Dr. Nealon, at the National Organization for Rare Disorders. You and your colleagues are thinking about these issues for all rare diseases, so you have a bit more of a landscape view of the, the topic. How should we think about that broader perspective when discussing biomarker qualification? All right, thanks, Susan. Um, and I will get to some things that we talked about in a prep call, but having listened to this delightful meeting, I think I'm going to start with a little more general Absolutely. commentary. Absolutely. Um, I was thinking there's two things that I am not that might be useful. I am not a world-class expert on mucopolysaccharidosis, such as our earlier speakers. I'm not a world-class expert on FDA regulation. But I've dabbled in both. And I now work uh, at Nord, where our mission is to try to improve the health and well-being of uh, all patients affected by rare diseases. Um, and Which is why you're here. Yes. <laughs> Uh, and I told Susan on a, on a, a prep call that I think we would look at it uh, from a point of view that's already been kind of anticipated by some of the earlier comments, including Jim's, that um, while there's understandably a desire to um, get a first drug approved, some kind of treatment approved for a disease, no matter what, on some level, that um, accelerated approval has been under threat. Mm, and quite a look, bit. And looking across the scope of the rare diseases, it's important to Nord and its long active, now 41-year-old public policy team to try to protect accelerated uh, approval. Um, and I might point you all to look back about two years. I think in December of 2021, Nord's public policy team put out about a 30-page uh, report on uh, accelerated uh, approval. And um, again, I'm not the policy expert, and wear that hat for a moment. And um, you know, um, point out that one of the things it kind of did was review um, the progress of the accelerated approval pathway up to that time. And 
it's a little bit difficult to judge that based on the fraction of things that received accelerated approval that have already been uh, fully or traditionally approved because that conversion is difficult as has already been mentioned and some of them are behind. That doesn't mean they will, won't get there. Uh, but only 6.3% of the drugs that had been approved by accelerated approval uh, had been withdrawn. So fundamentally, as I think it was, uh, who said this earlier, um, um, <laughs> Mark uh, Dant, when he said, you know, the system is working, we just have to let the system work. Uh, and that resonated with, with, with me because fundamentally, if, you know, 84% have been left on the market and FDA is comfortable with that, the system is basically working. You do have periodically something that the payers refuse to pay for or that, um, you know, has a confirmatory trial that fails and voices come up why do we have this accelerated approval? And what Nord, on a public policy front, wants to defend is the idea that an FDA approval is an FDA approval, and payers should pay for it. They shouldn't be second guessing the FDA. That works for everybody's benefit. But then the balancing thing is we have to try to make sure that um, sponsors design studies that use biomarkers and approaches that are as careful as the ones we heard about today. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the other opening point I wanted to make again uh, as a generalist. Uh, for about 12 years, I was the principal doctor at Boston Children's Hospital doing enzyme replacement therapies, and I got involved in a number of different clinical trials, but it was never the focus of my own research. I had a lab that did more basic science things, um, and that, that's why I was sort of dabbling in that area, but, um, uh, gosh, what was I going to say? Um, um, you That's all right. Know where I was headed, right? Uh, it, uh, it, I think so, but let's lead you to the right place. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, in in acknowledge, I think you were speaking to the also the collaboration in the scientific community here, right? Oh, that you had you know, strong I'm, I'm clinical jumping. trials. I, you know, yep. I, I was going to. I know what I was getting back to. Um, no, what I was going to get back to was the, the general point. That having listened to the whole day's session mm -hmm. and coming from someone who's a laboratory scientist, a clinical investigator, a patient advocate, a practicing physician still, I, for one, became convinced of the things that we heard today about how the CSF heparin sulfate would fulfill, I think, those criteria that <coughs> Peter Mark started us off with for a good biomarker to be used in this fashion with accelerated approval as a goal. Uh, and also was convinced, you know, after today's discussion, that in fact it would be uh, likely to predict, you know, clinical benefit. Um, and so uh, don't let, you know, the cautionary note uh, that not every biomarker is suitable take mm -hmm. away from the fact that today's discussion, I think, puts this particular group of disorders, the neuropathic MPS disorders, on what seems like a, a good platform mm -hmm. um, to move forward. Mm -hmm. So you found yourself illuminated by the information shared. I did. All right, uh, that it, it's more clear now. Any, if there's no thoughts on that, I want to turn, uh, let's talk a little bit about the drug developer perspective. And I'm going to go first to you, John, and then I'll come back to you, Dr. Ho. Um, as we mentioned, you joining our stage from both Amicus Therapeutics and your incoming role at Bio. What lessons have you learned today and then in, in decades of experience in the biomarker qualification space? And what would you identify as challenges that we still need to, to overcome? Yeah, Susan, you know, it's interesting. When you listen to the discussion today and you see the data on what's happened now in MPS and with the cerebral spinal fluid and HS as a marker, I think it's overwhelmingly clear with that, these products in this disease, with this biomarker, it is reasonably likely to predict clinical benefit and should be, as we've discussed, you know, subject to the accelerated approval pathway. You know, it, it's interesting, when you look at the accelerated approval pathway itself, the legislation is very clear and is very unique that they put an adjective and an adverb in there, reasonably likely, and it's, papers have been written about it, what does that actually mean? It's somewhere over 50% that it's reasonably likely. And it also means we're going to make mistakes, and it yeah. may not necessarily be the ultimate drug. It oftentimes is not going to be. But it's going to be a very important tool in the arsenal, as we see in MPS3, in a disease where you've seen nothing but suffering for, for generations, for as long as we've known in medicine. So I, I think that's very important in this disease, but it raises a bigger issue. 
and that's where are we in, in rare disease drug development broadly. Um, we've come a long way. We've come a long way since the Orphan Drug Act, um, but we've got a long, long way to go. And I think we're finally at this inflection point where we have so many now of the tools of science to offer hope, uh, hope tempered with reality of the challenges of drug development. And now the challenge is how do we make sure that we're achieving the gold standard of science, uh, of, um, excuse me, of, of safety and efficacy grounded in key science. And to do that, you know, we've got so many of these challenges. Biomarkers are one tool that the regulators have, that we as drug developers, that experts have in determining safety and efficacy. It may take a lot of work to use it as a biomarker, as we've seen with, with the MPS disorders now. Uh, but also it can be you know, helpful in determining you know, dose or biologic activity. Mm -hmm. um, there, it's, it's a tool, and it can be a regulatory tool. But we're at this inflection point, and frankly, I think it's a crisis in the world of rare diseases, and we've seen this now, where so many programs have been delayed or stopped, or threatened to be delayed or stopped. And not because the science just doesn't work, sometimes that's the case, but the whole ecosystem isn't working the way it needs to for this next generation of therapies. I, uh, you know, at Amicus, we've, we've developed, we've had now approved two medicines, one for uh, people living with Febre disease and a next generation medicine for people living in, uh, with Pompe disease. Uh, and we've spent a lot of time and a lot of resources looking at these fatal brain diseases in children as well. And some with Jim, a number of different programs in gene therapy, some that we had licensed out of Nationwide Children's Hospital. When we announced that, and I'll just give a little framework here, when we announced our programs uh, in the Batten diseases, so 14 different subtypes of Batten disease, similar to some of the neurologic diseases we've talked about today, um, there was a lot of hope, a lot of great science. We actually went in the clinic in CLN6. We went in in CLN3. Again, just devastating brain diseases where children, again, lose the ability to walk, to talk, to think, to eat, and ultimately die. So we know what the outcome is going to be, and it's going to vary by child and <coughs> severity and, and ultimately you know, when they might succumb, when they might die from the disease. But we went in the clinic, and we did years of work, hundreds of millions of dollars, and in addition, we invested a lot of resources in preclinical work. And when we started that in the, about a year later in the fall of 2019, I got an email from a mom who had adopted a child from Africa with CLN1 Batten disease. Uh, and she just a lot of questions. She flew out from the West Coast, came to see us, as we, we've done and so many of us have all done with these families. And we finally gave her some hope. And we had research. And we had scientists working on it. Well, fast forward, and, and we've now had to discontinue all those programs and give them all back, as we did with Jim and the MPS programs, as we did with Nationwide and the Battens programs. And we're a reasonably successful company now with our mm -hmm. two approved products. And I had to explain yesterday at a call with that same mom. Mm -hmm. And she just asked, just gut-wrenching, how could you do this? How could you stop these programs? I said, look, let me tell you where gene therapy is, and let me tell you where biotech is, and, and give you at least my perspective. And, and there were three things I shared with her. Uh, the first is, look, the, the, the economy and the rise in interest rates has been tough for biotech. And long day, you know, I kind of explained that it raises the bar for investors, which means they require a higher degree of certainty. Mm -hmm. Secondly, the technologies are just, the diseases and the technologies are hard, harder than we even thought four or five years ago, including the manufacturing. But then the third thing we talked about, first to, first out of our control with a macro economy and interest rates, the second um, somewhat in our control in science and drug development, manufacturing, what we need to do to make sure that these are safe and effective medicines. But the third was regulatory science. And the example I gave was in one of those Batten's programs where we had done a pilot study in four children and we saw a clear separation from the natural history the, gu the guidance that we received, we've talked about this, was great, now go do a five-year placebo-controlled study. It, it just kind of went down. Mm -hmm. It was an uh, infeasible, un unfeasible study to do. Mm -hmm. And so for that and all those different reasons, we had to pivot. And I hope someday Amicus can come back to it. Uh, but the industry broadly, now we have more than at least 200 rare disease programs that we've identified that have stopped in the last several years for all of those and many, many more reasons. 
So, you know, for me, as we think about it, we're kind of on the dawn of this golden age of medicine. We've got so much hope and promise, and we're getting in our own way. And so let's think about, you know, people think, you know, for me as a parent or patient advocates or entrepreneurs, well, we, we'll, we'll take any risk, we'll do anything, and, and that's, that's not right, that's nonsense. Um, we will take smart risks, but we need to think about it. And what we do, we, we do at Amicus is ask everybody to think, if you had the disease, or you were the mom or a dad of a child with the disease, what would you do? When would you start a program? When would you stop it? How far would you push? Mm -hmm. Because time and money and all those resources are limited for parents and foundations and companies. And we've got to think about that in a practical world. And it means in partnership with regulators, we need to think of each drug and each disease uniquely. And think about the risk benefit assessment uniquely. And that's where biomarkers have to be an incredibly important tool. And I think, I think it was years back, Emil had, had given a talk and shown that of the, I think then maybe seven or 8,000 rare diseases, at the pace that we were going, it was gonna take, was it 150 years to treat half of them. That doesn't work. So mm -hmm. let's, let's find a way to make it work and let's take smart risks where and when we can. And let, let's work together as a community. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm struck, John, the, the, um, you know, the, the foundation was created to help advance regulatory science with a, because Congress recognized that there's a lot of science, right? You, you have the evolution of science with great people working on great things, but the regulator has to keep pace with that, and it's really challenging. Um, it is, just like, you know, we as innovators and, and academic researchers, NIH, the whole ecosystem, this, this virtuous circle of what it takes to make a medicine is really, really hard. And that's where we need to work together to make sure that regulatory science is progressing in lockstep with what we're doing in the mm -hmm. clinic, on the, in the benches, in our companies, our universities. So when we think about that, biomarkers are an important tool, as are natural history studies, Bayesian statistics, adaptive designs. Mm -hmm. And in the rare diseases, the whole notion of, well, pick an endpoint, pick, you know, for our, in muscle diseases, pick six minute walk and do a great big large study and roll the dice and if you hit a P, a .05, you win. If you don't, you're probably gonna lose. Mm -hmm. that, that, that doesn't make any sense as well. Think about it as a physician or a parent deciding mm -hmm. whether to have a child treated. You'd look at a whole range of risks and benefits, a heat map. You know, they did this, FDA did this very effectively you know, with Ultragenics and, and uh, Mepsevi when they looked at the multi-domain responder index. And you know, as we ultimately did with our Pompeii program, and it just lit up green. You knew it was working. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's, this isn't easier, it's not a lower bar. I, I really, really don't like the word regulate, or the words regulatory flexibility. It unnecessarily implies a lower standard, and mm -hmm. it's not. When we're bringing all these tools to bear, it's actually a higher regulatory science that we're asking for and that we need. And that's what we need in rare diseases. And, and now's the time that we need it. Mm -hmm. Which helps us, that's a, I think, a, a more helpful lens in thinking about the advancement of science and the sharing of information. Absolutely. That's, that's part of what's needed. Can I put a yes. question to John? Absolutely. So I, I'm guessing, John, you might prefer preponderance of the evidence over uh, well, we can't change the statute. Uh, yes, we're not gonna, we're not gonna change the statute. Um, no, you, you want the gold standard, right? You want safety and efficacy, but how you judge that is gonna be different. Each molecule, each disease. The risk you're willing to assume, the evidence generated that you need for substantial evidence of efficacy to support approval is got to be different in each disease. And that, that's what we really need. Um, so let me turn Dr. Ho, to you, you know, you're a neurologist and a drug developer for both rare and broad indications, um, and have the focus lens coming from Denali Therapeutics. What would you highlight? Yeah, great, thanks, Susan. So I just first wanna say I'm just very grateful to be here with this community. I think just starting broad, I've worked in uh, drug development in a number of therapeutic areas, include adult, including adult neurodegenerative disease, ophthalmology, and I think in those areas, we have seen the use of biomarkers, the use of anatomical endpoints to potentially support approvals. And so, you know, I think that this, this has been done for larger indications. And now as we think about what we have in front of us here today in addressing these MPS disorders, we have really great science that you all heard today. So why are we here today? We have a huge unmet medical need, and there's an urgency to this. Patients are dying because they have accumulation of this toxic substance in the brain that is leading to irreversible brain damage. 
we have a community here where we are coming together to build consensus. And it was wonderful to hear the talks today where I think there's alignment across our academic colleagues, our industry colleagues, physician scientists, that CSFHS is a suitable biomarker that is likely to predict clinical benefit. I think what's very important right now about the science is that the science is emerging and is progressing. And I want to applaud our FDA colleagues who we've seen them recently at the world meeting learning about the science. That's really important. We need to embrace that science. But I'll also just note that the science is not that new. The, the accumulation of heparin sulfate and glycosaminoglycans, this has been used to support approvals in peripheral disease. It is the way that now you've heard diseases are diagnosed. This is how they track progress. This is how they make sure that the patients are taking their medicine. And it's followed when patients even, for example, need to take a vacation and they miss a dose. Well, they're following those urinary gags to make sure that they know when the patient needs to come back. So this is really not that new science. Um, but what is new is really understanding how this science can be measured in the brain. With all of this, we need the FDA to move faster. And I think you've heard the challenges that we've had in clinical development, um, looking and relying on clinical endpoints. It's extremely challenging. We heard from Dr. Munzer. We heard from Dr. Jones. We heard from um, uh, Mr. Dant on the challenges of looking at clinical endpoints. And now we actually have science that has progressed that we don't have to do that. These clinical endpoints in these rare diseases with low prevalence take a long time, eight to 10 years from start to finish, particularly when you're looking at neurologic endpoints. That's really important because these programs are taking longer than they did for development of peripheral um, enzyme replacement therapy. Um, this costs upwards of $500 million to develop these programs over eight to 10 years. And most importantly, patients are asked to wait for eight to 10 years. That essentially means that you're impacting a generation of patients and a generation of families to try to understand if these medicines work. I was very struck by the point that several made about the fact that the ethics are questioned on doing randomized placebo-controlled trials. As a drug developer, I'm finding myself in a really challenging position because we are asked to do those randomized double-blind trials. And we have engaged with the community to understand the acceptability of that. And while we have heard today that the ethics are questioned, we've also been told, well, if that's the only way you can bring a medicine to our diseases, then that is what you need to do. And so we, we, have, we have done that. I think as we look at the science and we look at where we are today, we're ready to use this pathway for accelerated approval. And we need to apply this, and we need to move right away. The FDA understands this, and there is a guidance that a draft guidance started in 2018 for single enzyme rare diseases that have um, accumulation of substrate. Sounds exactly like what we're talking about. In 2020, that guidance was made a final guidance, but that has not been applied yet to um, these therapies. And maybe there are a number of questions why. Question might be, well, with CSF HS, is that reflecting brain HS? I think we heard very clearly from our speakers today, from Patty Dixon, um, uh, from, uh, from, from uh, others that there is clearly a relationship that we can clearly define between CSFHS and brain HS. Matthew Ellen would show very nice data across a number of programs showing that. We have the assays. I think Maria Fuller really addressed a lot of the questions that Peter Marks brought up around are the, the assay um, level of qualification and analytical validation that's required. We have these highly sensitive mass spec assays and now we have a pathway forward with this guidance. So we need to apply this guidance. And the question, I think, as we leave this workshop today is not whether CSFHS is a suitable biomarker, but how do we use this and what is the threshold that's required to support accelerated approval? I think all the programs you've heard today need an action plan with the FDA to move forward to evaluate these for accelerated approval. And the reason is that patients are waiting, and as you also heard today, they don't have time. Thank you, Carol. That was, um, you, I, you summed up my recap. I don't have to give it at the end of the meeting now um, because you, you captured, captured much of that. Um, oh, well, let's, Dr. Fahey, we've been, we've been talking about regulators all day. Yeah. And now, <laughs> now you true. can step to the microphone um, uh, along with your colleague. But as you sit at CBER, um, what are, share with us the agency's thoughts on using biomarkers to support development and review of treatments for rare diseases. So, you know, taking it up a level, but, but thinking through that. 
Um, you know, we'll just put it to you. Is the agency open to the use of accelerated approval in the rare disease space? Yeah, so first of all, thank you so much for having this discussion and for having me. I've really en enjoyed uh, listening to the panels today um, and the discussion topics. So I, I think Dr. Mark summed it up quite well. We do really support the use of appropriate biomarkers in rare diseases. At CBER, our goal is actually to advance the public health by ensuring that patients have products that are safe and effective available to them. We also recognize that for too many patients, we need better treatments than what's currently available today. Mm -hmm. And we also all know that sometimes the pace of drug development is much slower than what patients and families can afford. And so for that reason, we see tools like biomarkers and accelerated approval as critical tools for getting patients access to new, safe, and effective medications in a timely manner. Um, and so we actually encourage our sponsors to evaluate for potential biomarkers throughout the course of drug development. Um, and we, we also recognize that you know, it's especially important and helpful when the disease course is rare or the progression is quite slow or variable. It can be a very important tool in these diseases. But we also recognize that biomarker qualification is a significant undertaking, mm -hmm. and so we support collaboration in this space. With us, that means communicating with us early and often so that we can be on the same page and support biomarker <laughs> development as much as possible. It also means working with our partners in this space. So NIH, academia, sponsors, patient support groups, the nonprofit sector, because we work better when we all work together. Mm -hmm. um, we also you know, want to emphasize that we are and we recognize that we will have to collate multiple sources of evidence when we come to evaluate a biomarker. Um, so that can range from an awareness of the scientific community's consensus on the utility and appropriateness of a biomarker for its context of use, to what the preclinical data is showing, like animal models, um, to genetic and vitro data. Later on, we'll look at pharmacodynamic and mechanistic evidence. Um, and even potentially when appropriate and possible, the integration of real world data and real world evidence. Mm -hmm. um, I also think it's important, we oftentimes talk about, um, you know, when we think about biomarkers, we think about those that are likely or reasonably likely to predict a surrogate endpoint. But we actually recognize a multitude of biomarkers. And that ranges from those that can improve the ease and accuracy with which we can identify patient populations mm -hmm. to those that support trial enrichment, like identifying patients who are most likely to benefit from a drug, um, to later on um, those that can enhance patient safety by identifying toxicities earlier, and then of course surrogate endpoints, those that are likely to predict clinical benefit are reasonably likely. When we're assessing these biomarkers, we want to make sure we have a, a really good understanding of what uh, or how this biomarker is going to fulfill an unmet medical need, how it's going to benefit our patients. And we also want to very importantly make sure that we understand the risk of a biomarker not working. Dr. Bi mm. Dr. Marks brought this up uh, you know, this morning. Um, we want to know what are the potential consequences of a false positive or a false negative. Mm. These are really critical for us to understand as we're qualifying biomarkers. And we have lots of resources available for sponsors as they come to evaluate um, uh, biomarkers or to develop a biomarker, so everything from individual meetings with us mm -hmm. um, to CEDARS biomarker qualification program. We have a guidance document on biomarker qualification, looking at the evidentiary framework for developing a uh, biomarker. We have the best resource online. Um, you know, we have even a guidance documents specific to rare diseases, looking at drug development uh, considerations and biological products. So that's specific to biomarkers. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to accelerated approval, you know, like I said earlier, we see it as a really important pathway for expediting access to ser you know, treatments for serious diseases that don't have a meaning uh, meaningly available treatment uh, Meaningly, uh, meaningly efficacious yes. <laughs> treatment available. Um, and so, um, you know, we recognize that, you know, when it comes to patients and family members, when there's an unmet medical need, they may be willing to consider an increased or unknown risk if it means that they'll get a meaningful treatment benefit. And our job at the FDA is to really help identify and elucidate those risks as much as we can relative to the disease progression and support the development of safe and effective drugs. Sorry to use the term, but this is our, our way of, of, of um, regulatory flexibility in that we can you know, support the development of products that are safe um, and also that there's substantial evidence of effectiveness through adequate and well-controlled trials. 
And I think you can see our commitment to this space by looking at how many programs we have available um, to support rare disease, um, you know, the acceleration of rare disease drugs. Mm -hmm. um, so we have um, Dr. Marks' uh, The Start pilot program, yeah. which is akin to Operation Warp Speed for vaccines, but in the rare disease space. So you know, when we can work nimbly, can we support sponsors getting to the finish line faster? Um, we have, and I'm sure I'm going to mess up the allocation of the words here, but we have Cedars Rare Disease it Cures Accelerator, right? um, um, which is the, Plus, yeah. right? Something like that. It's available online, um, <laughs> which is a centralized platform or infrastructure for characterizing rare diseases, mm -hmm. uh, developing endpoints, and, um, and trial conduct. We work with organizations like the Critical Path Institute to um, further characterize the natural history of diseases. Um, and for biomarker development, we have the Rare Disease Advancement um, Endpoint Program, and we also have you know, funding opportunities, like right now there's grant opportunities available for rare neurodegenerative diseases um, to support the um, studies that look at natural history um, and, and um, can qualify biomarkers in that space, and we hope to continue to be able to do that. Which, so I hear the, um, the extent of the activity, which also, then tells me that, that in fact, while many don't recognize that the agency is open, like you want the dialogue and to better understand working within the, the you know, you are a regulator and so you have certain um, constraints, but, but is it, it there, there's interest in, in conversation and collaboration. Absolutely. I mean, from a personal perspective, as an ophthalmologist, it's very exciting for me to see any sort of advancement in the space. And so my, my hope and you know, why I joined the FDA, one of the many reasons why I joined is that we can be part of this important conversation and we can support um, really important programs getting to the finish line with the best signs possible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, Dr. Imperato, um, Thank you again for joining us. Uh, and I hope you're feeling well enough to answer this question. If not, you can toss it back to Cherie. Mm -hmm. um, but as, so as you think about using biomarkers for regulatory action, you know, Dr. Fathy just reminded us of really the, the, the scope, the, a significant extent of, of um, opportunities that are available and, and, and yet we, we recognize there, there's a need for more. But what, what challenges do you think about in using biomarkers for regulatory action? Because that's a, that, that's a question that only regulators can answer. Um, so how, how do you think about that? And, and then do those challenges end? We actually know they don't, but do, do they end after? How do you think about navigating those challenges in the post-approval period? Sure, happy to answer the question. Are you able to hear me okay? We can hear you. Okay, great. Um, I'm, first of all, apologies that I wasn't able to join uh, in person. I have uh, COVID. Fortunately, it's relatively mild. Um, I managed to avoid getting it for, uh, for four years, but my luck ran out, so um, <laughs> it was, it was um, you know, great to, um, great to, uh, to listen in virtually. Um, on the presentations uh, earlier in the day and I want to thank all the presenters um, it was really um, helpful and illuminating and uh, I really appreciated hearing uh, the presentations and um, and walk through of all the data that was uh, uh, presented um, so you know there are a number of, of, of challenges and 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 these are, are obviously well known to um, to this audience I'm, I'm happy to provide some insight into how we see this from you know, within the walls of, uh, of the agency. Um, and I want to reference a, um, a comment that, uh, that Mr. Dant made uh, in, his, uh, in his presentation this morning, um, and I'm loosely paraphrasing. Essentially, the, the, the essence was um, that our regulatory system must uh, evolve to, uh, to reflect advancing science. And uh, we at the agency absolutely agree with that. Um, that is uh, precisely the, re the reason that we are leaning into these uh, tools like biomarkers and accelerated approval because they are readily available to us um, in our regulatory toolbox um, and they can really uh, move the needle um, in delivering uh, novel therapies to, uh, to patients um, in need. And as Dr. Fathy mentioned, um, we have a whole slew of, um, of, of programs um, and avenues for interaction at the agency 
that are all in some way geared towards um, accelerating, enhancing, promoting, lowering the delta G for um, for interactions that are um, that are going to be substantive and productive with regard to um, to rare disease drug development. Um, so it's it's really you know there are a lot of challenges clearly, um, but um, a lot of opportunities um, as well. Um, you know I, as I as I heard the, um, the 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 presentations today, I was sort of thinking about. How do we make sense of, of what these challenges actually are and, and what are the different subset components? Because it's nice to kind of step back and, and think about the big picture and then ultimately come down and think about how do, how do we operationalize this on a on a day-to-day -day basis um, within review divisions at the FDA where the rubber meets the road. And I was thinking that the, the challenges fall into um, essentially three categories, um, evolution, collaboration, um, and communication. And I think there's an internal and an external component um, to all of those. With regard to evolution and, um, you know, um, thinking back to Mr. Dan's comment, um, there's been an explosion in, um, in basic science uh, over the past many years. Um, that explosion in knowledge has been rapidly translated to the clinic um, in the setting of many diseases. Um, and that's great news. Um, it presents a challenge from the regulatory standpoint because that advance has happened so quickly. Um, and so, um, reflexively, you know, from, from the standpoint of um, a regulator, how do we deal with, um, with the unique uh, regulatory challenges that are presented by um, advances that, um, that are wonderful, um, uh, products that clearly have um, uh, potential by virtue of available data, um, but um, don't fit squarely into uh, a known uh, regulatory uh, paradigm. Um, and so this this really segues into the um, to the second big bucket, and these are all you know overlapping, um, and that is collaboration. So um, it's clear to us; it has been for 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 some time now that um, that engaging all of the stakeholders in the drug development ecosystem is critical. Um, first and foremost, the patients. Um, we gain so much by um, by interacting with patients and listening to patients and caregivers, because when all is said and done. The, um, the drug is for the patient, um, and, um, and we really want to make sure that, that all of this, the decision-making uh, that occurs from the regulatory standpoint from A to Z centers the needs of the, uh, of the patient. So it was really helpful to hear um, some of these um, uh, uh, patient stories um, earlier in the day because that um, comes to tremendous benefit for, for, um, for FDA staff because um, you know, we can easily lose sight of the fact that there's a human behind, uh, you know, charts and graphs uh, and, and, and data. And that's a really, really critical thing to, to recognize. Um, so the, the, you know, continuing with this collaboration component. So there's the external component. You know, settings like this are, are super valuable to us. Um, uh, all of the, um, the forms of interaction that Dr. Pathy mentioned, uh, particularly for rare diseases. Um, and I, I also want to emphasize the collaboration that happens uh, within the walls of the, uh, of the FDA. Um, we have, um, simply for logistical purposes, you know, a, a highly structured um, organization with regard to, um, to, to disciplines. So, you know, for any individual drug development program, there is a chemistry manufacturing and controls team. There's a pharmacology toxicology team. There's a clinical team. There's a clinical pharmacology team. There's a biostatistics team, um, and the list um, goes on depending on the complexity of the of the submission. What we've recognized um, relatively recently is that because the evidentiary framework for biomarkers and accelerated approval is obligately um, uh, holistic, that though that interactions among those different disciplines is not a nice to have. It's it's absolutely essential. Um, particularly because um, we recognize that, um, speaking specifically from the clinical perspective, you know, the questions, so many of the questions that we would ideally want answered in a particular format, like a clinical study, we may not be able to, um, to answer in the, in the form of a clinical study. Um, and so it's essential for physicians, clinical reviewers, to understand um, and engage with pharmacology, toxicology um, colleagues who are evaluating data from uh, disease-relevant animal models. Um, and that is something that I have seen 
um, you know, really come into, into, into full bloom um, recently at the agency. It's not something that, um, you know, an external audience would be privy to because it's part of our, our, our day-to-day workflow. Um, but it's something that I think is important for, um, for patients, caregivers, advocates, and sponsors to know that, um, that, that we are really um, operationalizing the commitment to patients and to evaluating totality of evidence um, by virtue of all of these um, these interactions and um, and efforts to uh, to enhance internal um, collaboration, um, central to that obviously is is, is open communication. Um, mm-hmm. So we really are making um, efforts to do that um, internally. Um, and in addition, you know, the communication piece um, with our with our sponsors is 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 really prominent. Um, it's part and parcel of. These uh, the, these programs that we have in place to uh, to accelerate um, rare disease drug development, um, even absent engagement in the in the context of one of those specific programs, um, all of our you know alphabet soup of of meetings, uh, formal meetings that we have with um, with sponsors are where um, we ultimately work through um, these critical issues. So um, we're. For- very fortunate in the Center for Biologics and in the um, Office of Therapeutic Products to have a very positive culture when it comes to collaboration and, and communication. It's something that um, that Dr. Marks and, and Dr. Verdun uh, foster, um, and so it is it is definitely um, a focus to enhance the quality of our communication with um, with our sponsors because we recognize that these are difficult issues to um, to wade through. And communication is essential. It's difficult to over communicate in settings where there are so many possible, you know, possible um, points of, of, of miscommunication. And so um, we have, uh, of course, you know, limited time and limited resources. I would love to be able to, you know, to pick up the phone, you know, <laughs> whenever there is a quick issue you'd like to have resolved by um, by speaking to to a sponsor. We're bound by, you know, the formality of our, of our interactions, but we are looking for you know, for opportunities to um, wherever possible to to enhance um, you know the closeness and and the and the and the quality of those um, communications with sponsors. So, um, I, I I totally understand you know the the frustration um, that's been you know expressed in in, in various ways. Um, I don't know that this will come as any you know degree of reassurance, but um, you know. Regulatory review is a is a human enterprise. Um, you know we haven't been replaced by um, by robots yet, um, and so you know we're we do approach develop, drug development and regulation in this space with a tremendous degree of empathy, and um, it is really very very challenging. Um, we, um, you know, I would say that the, the most electric day you know at at FDA. Um, bar none is when we, you know, announce a, a novel product approval. Um, it is so exciting. Um, so the, the review teams um, within, you know, at the, at the agency are so excited about delivering novel products um, to patients. Um, and um, and you know, as Dr. Marks highlighted earlier this morning, um, accelerated approval and biomarkers um, are a really really powerful tool. Um, we've used them. We're going to continue to use them. Um, and I think um, you know the future is um, very very bright, and I'm I'm, I'm very excited about uh, what's uh, what's to come, and and I'm fundamentally most excited for for what this is going to mean for patients and their families. So you're um, capturing the the evolution, the collaboration, and the communication. I was I was struck that your collaboration was both outside the agency and then within the agency, um, and that was a, a question that came up quite a bit. Um, earlier in the day. But I, I want to make sure that we turn um, to, to Dr. O'Neill to think through, um, I, as we said and we heard powerfully today, that top of mind in discussion in rare and ultra rare disease is, is the voice of the patient and their caregiver. Um, you've been described as a powerful and candid advocate um, for accelerated approval. And, and I, I want to make sure I get this right uh, if I paraphrase it. but. Um, that the, prom- the preference for the uncertainty of promising performance and potential risks versus the certainty of a painful life. Um, what, what would you want to make sure that we think through as we're, we're talking about 
um, opportunities in the ecosystem in rare disease development and this this uh, framework that Dr. Imperato, 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 Gavin, I'm going to get it right, uh, not today because I have them all in my head, but on um, evolution, collaboration, and communication. Yeah, thank, thank you, Susan. It's, it's really an honor to be here with literally the experts in the space. The discussion has been incredible. Um, the information shared, I think, has taken us all to a new level, and so it's the end of the day, <laughs> and much has been said, um, but I'll share you know, my perspective, where I come from, which is really kind of a blended perspective, mm -hmm. that of a pediatrician yeah. who's been able to become a patient advocate and you know, author papers on clinical management guidelines and caregiver preference uh, for treatments for San Filippo syndrome. Um, but the reason I'm here is because our personal life was shattered by a diagnosis um, of my daughter, Eliza, um, 11 years ago. Um, and over that time, um, if I you know, kind of take this view back, the cycle that we see in repetition, which John described, is this a company comes into the space, yay, we're excited. There's hope, the science is excellent. Um, there's a lot of promise. The company engages with the agency. There is dialogue, there is challenge in, in clarity about what that path forward is. Uh, I think on everyone's part. And the company comes back, there's adjustments, there's changing of the bar, there's, you know, a a lot of back and forth with long timelines in between. And so we have now the timeline has been drawn out, the monetary costs have gone through the roof, um, and the company ends up either shelving the program or going out of business trying to make it work. Either way, our children are abandoned. You know, whatever the reason, this is the result, and our kids are the people who pay the price for it. Um, you can rinse and repeat that for every neurologic MPS disease and so many other um, diseases. Um, you know, we've heard a lot about this long timeline of the neurologic deterioration, and I think it's clear and evident that that does not allow neurologic MPS diseases to fit into a traditional drug development paradigm. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have been trying to force it into that model and we have resulted in exactly zero approved therapies directed at neurologic component of MPS diseases over the past 20 years, including no treatments of any kind ever for the most prevalent form of neurologic MPS, which is San Filippo syndrome. So clearly, we are stuck. Mm -hmm. we, are, we are all stuck, and I think we are all trying to figure out how to get unstuck. Um, but there really is a regulatory path the accelerated approval path is, is here for us. Um, and, and I think this has allowed us a chance to really talk about how we can move forward in that. Um, you know, you asked about uncertainty because mm -hmm. in accelerated approval, naturally uncertainty is going to be a component of that. But I think we take a step back and, and understand what we do know for certain because there's a lot more that we do know than we don't know. And what we do know is that this disease causes unrelenting losses of every skill. And you saw that in the videos this morning. Our kids go from singing their ABCs to utterances, stuttering, and then silence. From enjoying their birthday cake to being fed through a gastrostomy tube in their stomach. Running wildly on the beach, through the streets, where you can barely keep a hold of them to being unable to move and even roll over in bed. They lose the ability to engage with us and the people that love them most. Our children become locked in and lost to us, even though they are right there in front of us. And after their words are gone, we're left to become detectives trying to quell the frequent periods of screaming and distress that we live with mm -hmm. every day. Um, you know, we know our kids die early. 
But one parent said to me, you know what, I know what's coming, but I fear my child's suffering more than I fear her death. And that is true. Um, living longer is important, and we want our kids here. Mm -hmm. But we want them to have a decent quality of life. Mm -hmm. And that means something different to all of us. Um, you know, um, what I just described is the reality of no treatment, and that is a very real risk. San Filippo and neurologic MPS disease itself causes catastrophic, irreversible brain injury and harm to every single person who has this disease. And logically, parents weigh these facts and risks heavily in their risk-benefit considerations. And we ask that regulators also meaningfully incorporate this weighting into the regulatory decisions they, they make as part of their Paducah <coughs> mandate. We also know that withholding treatment in the face of likely beneficial therapies known to address that primary substrate, that toxic heparin sulfate, causes harm. And, and we should be thinking about this. Um, we've heard today about um, children being subjected to randomized trials. Mm -hmm. and, and that is a real risk that I think we are overlooking. Um, you know, former acting commissioner Janet Woodcock spoke about this when she was reflecting on the use of placebo-controlled trials in rare or serious disease. And she said, you know, people say that they want placebo-controlled trials, but I always ask them, would you be willing to die for a p-value? And in this case, specifically in our context, I would say, would you be willing to let your infant or toddler during a period of maximum cognitive vulnerability and critical neurodevelopmental windows to be enrolled in a study where they will be allowed to develop irreversible brain injury? I mean, we, we have got to think very hard about this and find a more humane and ethical way forward. Um, I know that our science with these biomarkers will allow us to make a more creative pathway. Um, when we think about safety, you know, that's, that's one of those risks, mm -hmm. that's one of those uncertain factors, but really by the time we arrive at considering accelerated approval, safety is no longer a hypothetical kind of amorphous thing. We have already gathered so much information from the phase one, two safety studies. And when doctors talk with patients about a drug that may be approved by accelerated approval, they will have that information. And, and as John said, we make smart decisions. We are not willy-nilly throwing our kids to the wind. We, we want the information, we need the information, and that needs to be made on an individual basis with our healthcare team. Mm -hmm. Um, we really see these risk-benefit calculations play out with the actions of patients in the clinical trials, though. And that's going to give us a real-world example of, you know, what is the risk tolerance for these populations? Well, it's playing out before us in those patients that have been coming into the clinic year after year, getting weekly infusions into a, a port in their brain, going into mm -hmm. the ventricle of their brain, or being sedated or held down for monthly um, spinal fluid infusions, as in Cole's case. And those really reflect the risk-benefit um, profile and their tolerance for uncertainty around long-term clinical outcomes. You know, families are not always steeped in the science and the details of that, but mm -hmm. they do rely on their doctors, and they do understand the meaningfulness of heparin sulfate's impact upon their child very clearly and from the moment of diagnosis. They know that heparin sulfate in excess is the problem. It is the disease. It's what defines it. It's what um, was used to make their diagnosis, and it's what drives the pathology. So they, they appreciate when they understand that, yes, this treatment reduces heparin sulfate. That's, that's a very accessible piece of scientific information in their decision making. So what residual uncertainty are we left with? Um, obviously, we will need lengthy follow-up of patients to fully elucidate, you know, the clinical effect of mm -hmm. any treatment. Um, that's required, that's desired by patients as well as everyone else. So um, 
we, we absolutely want that to happen. Um, you know, we've heard today about treating the ideal patient, this very young pre-symptomatic patient, and absolutely that's ideal, um, but we live in the real world, and the reality is that those patients are identified exceedingly rarely, and usually because of a sibling. 99% of the identified population is symptomatic, and those patients, too, can have significant and meaningful um, benefit from treatments. It will take longer to see it, to see it diverge from the natural history. Um, but that's the right thing to do. Um, we can't leave a whole generation of kids behind just because we would like to see a large magnitude effect. Um, and those things really are only going to happen in a post-marketing situation. So, you know, I think our community's tolerance for uncertainty is quite well understood. And, um, you know, respectfully, we ask that the FDA, and I think we're hearing this, that, that this robust discussion, hearing the advancing science, looking at this large body of evidence, um, that they'll take that back and, and help open the door to equitable access to this really important regulatory pathway, which is accelerated approval. We have safety information, we have a valid biomarker, and we have treatments that are really right here about to be lost that are reasonably likely to help children. So we really, um, we need now, we need now, we always need now, right? But we, we truly do need now, or we're gonna lose another generation of our kids. I was waiting because I was pretty sure there was going to be applause there. So it was just <laughs> uh, right, you're, you're helping uh, in, in the ecosystem that we were talking about, right? And the, the challenges in the ecosystem, I, I think, um, uh, John, you talked about it. Um, Dr. Wilson, you did as, as well, that we've got to think through what do we know um, what don't we know? How do we apply it? It's, it's difficult space, but there's a reason to do the difficult work. Um, and and that's, mm -hmm. that's important for us to think through. Uh, Dr. Wilson, I noted that you said you wanted to come back to something. Do you remember what it was? Can't remember what it is, but I do have a thought. That's all right, <laughs> share that. And you know, when I was talking to some of the panelists before and about this meeting, it was described in various ways, but. Uh, some brought it up as a watershed moment. Mm -hmm. and, and I've been doing this for a long, long time. And there's something different. I feel something different. Um, the science has evolved, like science does, faster than probably we would have ever expected. Uh, and, and, and health authorities um, are engaged. It, 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 it's different now than, than, than it was before. But, but since I run the Orphan Disease Center, I think, think the, the one thing that really has changed as, as the patient advocacy groups uh, have educated themselves and become empowered. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and, and maybe it's just timing, but I think the time is right now uh, where people are coming together. And I would argue uh, that all of us uh, you know, come together and um, and let's try to look forward rather than backwards. Mm -hmm. and, um, but hold each of us accountable to one another in this mm -hmm. moment, if this is, and I think this is the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you then, you, you set us up perhaps, um, somehow we have uh, gone through nearly all of our time uh, <laughs> with, with insights from, from uh, you know, from a, the people who we said needed to collaborate. I think this, this matches a bit the list that you, you laid out for us earlier today, Mark, in making sure that we had the, the clinicians, the drug developers, the patients, the uh, industry, and the regulators um, coming through. I, I want to give you each, I'm not going to ask you a yes, no question, um, but I do want to give you each a minute um, to to say something about this space, if, it's, if it would be great if you want to say what's most helpful in navigating the challenges of qualifying biomarkers, if it's what's the one thing you think we'd like to see in addressing rare diseases, you, you get one minute um, and one, one shot here. Um, 
And Carol, you're first. So let me, I'll tee you up. We'll go Dr. Ho, Dr. Wilson, Dr. Favey. Yeah, so I, I want to just go back to why we're here today. And I think you've heard there's an urgent need. You've heard from Kara. You've heard from Mark Dant. There are other um, moms of children in the audience here. And we have a path. The science really is breaking open for understanding these neurologic diseases and also what is downstream, the disease process that's discussed in the 2020 guidance. If you can understand the disease process, then it's appropriate to use this accumulated substrate as a surrogate biomarker to support accelerated approval. We want to see that happen. And we understand that there are a lot of processes in place, and this isn't something that can happen overnight. But this, this is a problem that, as Kara really outlined, we've been facing over a number of years. While the science is accelerating, we need to accelerate our regulatory pathway to get these medicines approved. And that's what I really hope that today serves really as a catalyst for the community mm -hmm. to come together, for academia, for industry, um, for our patient advocacy to come together to unify on a path forward and work collaboratively with the FDA across both the CEDAR and the CBER division of the FDA to have a unified path that's clear for all of our companies to come forward with our promising medications with a path for review and approval. Mm -hmm. Dr. Wilson. So aspirationally, um, what I also suggest we think about as we come forward here in the United States is that genetic diseases are global. And, yes. And, and, the yes. Need, and the need is global. Uh, and there are unique uh, challenges, but also unique opportunities. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think the advocacy groups often uh, bring those communities together, social media helps. And I was delighted to see that FDA is, uh, uh, um, brought forward uh, a program to try to harmonize. But, but let's, let's, when, let's get this done, <laughs> but let's mm -hmm. then uh, take on the world. Right, right. Dr. Favey, Dr. Imperato, Dr. Uh, O'Neill. I'm pointing in the wrong direction. So, <laughs> no Sheree. Yeah. Um, so again, thanks again for, for allowing us to have this conversation. I think it's, it's easy also to see the FDA as kind of a faceless organization and hopefully um, situations like this allow us to, you know, really emphasize that we join the FDA because we do want to support our patients in our field um, to get access to treatments that are safe and effective for them. Um, and I really think we have very talented people at the FDA pushing the boundaries of regulatory science to um, really get us, um, you know, promising new ways to look at, uh, you know, how we can answer these tough questions in a, in a very sound and safe manner. Great. Uh, Gavin, then Kara, then John. Gavin. Thanks. Yeah, I, I, I certainly echo that sentiment. And, uh, you know, I, I would add that, um, you know, there, there's, there's a tremendous amount of enthusiasm um, at FDA uh, about bringing novel products to, uh, to patients in need. There really is. Um, and, um, you know, I think that, as, as many have highlighted in, in today's workshop, um, we're, we're living through a paradigm shift, um, and that's naturally going to be um, challenging. It's going to be um, painful, um, but the only way to, to, to get through it is, um, is together. So, um, you know, I think the collaboration and communication are really going to be um, essential. Um, and um, uh, the other point I wanted to highlight is that, you know, uh, Mr. Crowley had mentioned this. Um, you know, we at the agency cannot be... Um, or cannot function as though um, the broader ecosystem of, of, of drug development uh, does not exist. Um, it's a key part of our mission to facilitate the, um, uh, the availability of, of, of novel products for, for patients in need. And we can only do that um, if we have uh, drug developers who are you know, actively engaged um, in the space. And so um, there's a responsibility, uh, I think, uh, for the agency in that regard. And I think, you know, leveraging these tools that we have, um, biomarkers and accelerated approval will really be um, critical to demonstrate that there is, uh, there is a path forward for, uh, for products in this space, that they are ultimately going to get um, to patients because um, that's such a critical part of, uh, of our mission. And um, it's fundamentally our job. And it is, you know, it's, um, you know, congressionally mandated. It's the law. So, um, you know, we are, um, we are with, um, you know, some degree of, of interpretability and flexibility um, delivering what we can through our statutory authorities to, um, 
to meet unmet needs. So, um, so thanks so much again. This was really, really, really productive, and and appreciate everyone sharing their uh, their perspectives. Fabulous, Kara, John, Ed, Kara. Um, Gavin, I really appreciated your your commentary about the collaboration piece and the communication piece, and and I think. <coughs> Absolutely, that's the key. So much of things we're, we're guessing, we're trying to mind read, we're trying to anticipate and prepare. And, and so when questions come up that are related to the patient experience, risk benefit, things like that, being able to hear from the agency what those are instead of trying to maybe guess what those are and, and develop materials and understanding around those would be incredibly helpful moving forward. Um, I think the fact that there are so many of you here and online um, is a signal about what what you know needs to needs to move forward and and, your, and the goodwill to do that and I'm just um, very encouraged by that and and thankful. Fabulous, John, Ed. The yeah, clock is I'll just say, That's like Jim, bit. I'm also very enthusiastic. <laughs> I do think there is a lot of history here, some of it very good, some of it very challenging over mm -hmm. many years. But now is the time, and this is the moment, I think, as we look forward. So, so I'm very enthusiastic about what we see. And when we talk about collaboration, communication, it also means resources and leadership mm -hmm. <laughs> um, that come along with that, obviously, from you know, the great leadership of Dr. Marks to so many great people at the FDA. And we need to not only collaborate but empower each other. Um, I'm an advocate of you know, bringing this together under a center for rare diseases. I think now is the time. You saw how it transformed the world of cancer and oncology. So to reduce the inconsistencies across CEDAR and CBER, to bring more resources to bear greater leadership, um, I think that could be a very effective tool and a discussion we should have as we look forward. The last point I'll, I'll leave you with is one of, of time. And Kara, you so uh, eloquently and passionately Describe and emotionally appropriately describe that for all of us in this room um, to think about that is time. When we look at what we as developers or parents or regulators think, what is substantial evidence of efficacy and what is sufficient for safety and efficacy to think about time to bring that in. Because if we start with the assumption, what you also said, Kara, that you know, we could be dooming another generation of children and these diseases of neurodegeneration specifically if we start with the assumption that that's not acceptable. So how do we then begin to think about what do we do and what tools do we bring to bear? What mindset do we bring? Mm -hmm. Because delay and denial we know will lead to suffering and death and we all agree that's not acceptable. Mm -hmm. So now's the time. Dr. Neelan. Yeah. <clears throat> so I want to reiterate something that's already been touched on today, which is that for the rare genetic diseases, where unlike common things like headaches or asthma, which we still don't fully understand, <laughs> we do know exactly what the underlying cause was. And especially for the metabolic disorders, we also know the next few steps towards the pathogenesis. And this really seems like a prime area to use biomarkers and accelerated approval and get it right many more times than you get it wrong. And uh, I hope that you know, the, the careful work that has gone into this meeting and the sort of the di dissection of the current state of affairs for the neuro neuronopathic MPS may not only lead to, you know, good decisions coming for those diseases, but perhaps be another demonstration of this more broadly. Mm -hmm. With that, we'll take your enthusiasm. We'll close you out. I am sorry that we are three minutes over. We strive to not do that, but we also had to give voice to these extraordinary panelists. So join me in thanking all of our panelists.